<clears throat> so welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, the appointed time to begin the planning board meeting um, for August uh, 12th, 2021. Um, we have a, a, a new member with us. Um, so we're going to start very quickly uh, by uh, doing introductions for the uh, benefit of everybody here, but also <laughs> especially uh, the those the planning board members uh, ourselves um, to meet our new person. So I'll start with myself. I'm Marissa Elkins. I'm vice chair um, of, of the planning board. And uh, I'll move. I'm just going to call on people. Uh, so Sam, you. I'm my name is Sam Taylor. I'm on the planning board. <laughs> Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Tate. I'm an associate member on the planning board for maybe six months or so. All right, Corinne. And and Corinne, since you're new, tell us just a, a, a very brief bit about yourself. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Corinne. I'm the new associate member. Um, I, let's see, what's like my fun fact? I just have, I just got a puppy. He's here with me. So if you hear barking in the background, that's that. Um, I work in state politics, so I'm kind of more familiar with the state infrastructure and planning process, but I'm really excited to uh, learn a lot here as well. Very good. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Thank George. you. Very nice to meet you. I'm George Kohout. Uh, I've been on the planning board a couple of times. This is my second time around. I've been a uh, the chair for a couple of years now. Um, welcome aboard. If he were not uh, outside of a hanging outside of a library or something in Maine, he'd be running the meeting tonight. But uh, David, uh, I'm David Whitehill. I've been on the planning board for a year, two years, maybe. Uh, I'm an architect in my other life, and uh, welcome. And Krista. We're just doing introductions tonight because we have a new member. Right, got it, sorry. Joined in late. Hi, I'm Krista. I've been on the planning board, I think a couple of years now. I'm a realtor for the Murphys and I also work at RK Miles, which is a building material supplier in Hatfield. So welcome. Very good. Yes, George. Oh, you're saying you're waving, hello. All right. Um, all right, <laughs> so we, in the interest of not getting uh, behind, uh, too far behind, um, uh, so at seven o'clock, um, I would open briefly uh, for uh, public comment. We would, if anybody has anything to say that is not uh, about anything that's on the agenda tonight, uh, we, if anybody has anything to say, if you can wave your, wave your hand or do the hands up button. Anybody? Hey, Marissa. Yeah. I should probably just note for the record uh, for our first, I think our first agenda is uh, Kiter Builders. I have a working relationship with Kiter Builders through RK Miles, mm -hmm. but I don't believe it should cause any kind of conflict or my ability to be impartial and fair during our decision-making process. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, thanks for, for putting that on the record. We'll uh, note it for when we move ahead in just a second to, to that issue. Um, no problem. All right, so seeing uh, nothing else, um, I will go ahead and move on to that, to the seven o'clock um, site plan, Kiter Builders new two family um, uh, 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 plan. <laughs> um, so if we can have whoever is speaking for them, I think we have, uh, I don't have a name on it. Sorry, I don't have that in front of me. Hello, this is Scott Kiter. How's everybody doing tonight? Good, thanks. Hi, Scott. Hi. Um, would you, do you have the drawings in front of you or what is the best way for us to get that information in front of the board? So if you could screen share, Scott, I did make you co-host um, okay. and show the plans um, uh, for the public as well as the board. Um, okay. When I go through them, that would be great. Very good. All right, Just hang in there. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, my wife, Jill, and I uh, own Kiter uh, Builders in Florence, and Jill's here with me. Uh, we recently, last year, acquired um, 5759 Main Street, uh, which has Stars Pizza in, the, in that building, and we've been moving, renovating that building, and uh, on the same building lot is uh, a single-family residential structure uh, in disrepair. It's uh, off of Bratton Court, and it is unofficially known as Two Bratton Court. <clears throat> um, we, this is an investment property for Jill and I, and we were, it is zoned uh, general business. Uh, it is a little bit odd. It's a pre-existing non-conforming condition with this back structure. Uh, and given the uh, level of disrepair, we feel it makes the most sense to demolish the building. And the question we had for ourselves was what's best to uh, put back in its place uh, to, you know, not only um, be a good investment for us and our business, but also for the community. Uh, we ultimately ended up with uh, a two family um, building to land in essentially the same footprint uh, with the exception of a small jog and exterior stair. Um, and it, it would basically, it basically what we're doing is adding a second unit above um, what would have been the same, the, uh, the unit that's already there. Um, but again, the framing and uh, foundation is bad enough that we, we do want to remove the structure in its entirety. Um, prior to submitting this information, I did work with Carolyn and the DPW to uh, try and accommodate um, as many, as much of their input as possible. And so we put information such as parking, uh, rubbish uh, management, <clears throat> um, obviously all of the open space and uh, building size information on this drawing set that's on my screen. Um, and so would you like me to so the site plan is is here. Uh, let me just make it a little bit larger. And so the uh, the building where my cursor is uh, is of course 5759 on Main Street. This blue uh, shaded structure is is the one in, that we're talking about. This is a currently a driveway that's in terrible condition. Uh, as part of this project, we would be uh, repaving this, this driveway. It's a shared driveway for uh, 5759 Main Street and for 2 Bratton Court. Um, and so these two cars being shown are parking one car per unit for 2 Bratton Court. Um, is there anything else on the site plan that you would like me to, to talk about? before I show you the floor plans? I don't see anybody. You, you can go ahead. Okay. All right. And moving down here, um, you can see the arrow in the bottom right corner showing plan north is to the left. So that's kind of Bratton Court is running this left to right. Um, so <clears throat> there is an, again, this porch is in the same footprint as an existing porch. Uh, so the ground level unit, uh, main access is uh, off of the front of the building. And then there's a secondary uh, egress that would be coming off of the back uh, right here. And these are both two bedroom apartments. Uh, each will have its own washer and dryer uh, and some open floor plan living space and kitchen. Um, upstairs is essentially identical with the exception of not having the, um, the porch. Uh, this structure is being, the, the, the roof is a single slope um, pitch. It would be, I believe it's around a three and 12 pitch, which is uh, not very steep uh, in the idea here it is our hope that the budget will afford us putting a, a sol photovoltaic system on this roof. Uh, we certainly at a minimum will be uh, designing the, the, uh, the structure of the roof assembly to accommodate 
solar. Um, and, that, and it's our hope to uh, fit that into this project. So this is the front elevation from Bratton Court. And this would be a side elevation. Um, let's see, this is from the driveway side, Stars Pizza side. And this is the rear of the building. <clears throat> um, this is the primary entry for the second floor. There's an interior st stairwell. This here uh, is the secondary egress for the second floor. And this is the north elevation of the building. And that's that secondary egress that would bring a person out to the front. And this is an existing conditions drawing. This is what we have currently. And so again, you can see we're putting the building back into the same footprint. This jog here, uh, we, the design currently has us filling this in. So um, just so as to make the space a little more functional. And again, here uh, is where that staircase is. And this is just an existing conditions drawing of the, of the building that's there now. And same here. These are a couple of photos showing uh, what we have currently. It's essentially a building that's been more or less hodgepodge over the years. It's got many different uh, life cycles uh, and uh, vintages. Um, the roof is failing. There's a lot of rot on the building. The foundation has disrepair and the framing is, is cracking and bowing in the floor assembly. Um, this is just a photo showing the structure uh, from Bratton Court and Main Street intersection. Um, as part of this, uh, this project, I will just point out as part of the uh, overall project, we have um, worked with Stars Pizza. This is a four cubic yard dumpster. We've reduced that to a two cubic yard dumpster and we've put a, a concrete dumpster pad behind the building and we're doing a little bit of fencing here to conceal this to make it look nicer. Um, and we have been working with the city. Uh, these things here, a couple of steel posts that will be installed uh, for a little bit of outdoor seating for Stars Pizza um, that is uh, temporary. And this is a photo showing the, the building from down on Bratton Court looking back towards Main Street. This tree I will point out, um, it, it, I'm not an arborist, um, certainly not qualified to make any assessment. There, there is some uh, signs of issues with the tree. I think uh, the city, the DPW will be looking at that, but regardless, we will be um, putting in uh, protect our normal tree protections to make sure that we are very, very careful as to protect that. Also, when we dismantle this black foundation, uh, we will do it from the inside of the building and we'll work with an arborist to uh, properly uh, cut any roots that may be in conflict with the building. And then um, um, when we reconstruct uh, the new foundation, we will do that very carefully as well. Um, that's all I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so I have a question and maybe it's more for Carolyn. So I, it, the, uh, you know, the notes, um, say that there, there's an issue with the parking when, when are we, or what, or maybe it's also for Scott. So are, are we, are you asking for approval um, for re a reduced number of parking spaces? Uh, no, no, it's my understanding that by providing two parking spaces for, uh, this is 2000 cumulative square feet, one, two 1000 square foot units. Um, it is my understanding that one car per unit is the uh, is the standard. Okay, okay. There was just something in the note saying that we could uh, re yeah. approve less, so I wasn't clear if if that, if that request was actually made. I see. So the request hasn't been made. I, I will just to clarify, you the the zoning does allow. Um, parking spaces to be in tandem and count for parking for a 
single unit. So unit, if, if two parking spaces were required per unit, then each unit could have a tandem space, one behind the other, but not when it's different units, because as you can imagine, um, it would be difficult to, um, Are, are my like, fire alarms going off? Oh, great. <laughs> um, okay. I don't know what's going on, but um, just want to finish my thought, and then I'm going to go figure out what the heck's going on. <laughs> um, but anyway, so this parking arrangement is, does not meet the parking requirements for one space per unit because you can't share, you know, the backup space when it's two separate, two different units. Um, however. This is in the general business district, and we do not require additional parking spaces to be calculated for um, the addition of a second floor above an existing first floor unit. And the, the idea behind that is that there is potentially other parking, um, are other parking options in a downtown or downtown Florence, but also more importantly, um, the goal is not to um, is to encourage verticality and expansion of uses um, vertically um, and not um, discourage people from doing that just because they can't meet a parking requirement. So that ultimately was why the zoning was written the way it is, which is that you don't need to provide additional parking when you're adding square footage. So whatever existed for that single family home is can Pretty legally remain good. as is. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then, and then the other piece is, obviously the concern would be during snow emergencies, if you had to bring, get the cars off the street, I, um, you know, there is room for two parking spaces. And, and in addition, there's the sort of restaurant delivery, which probably isn't happening overnight during a snow emergency. So potentially um, people, occupants could, figure out how to pull those cars off the street in that location um, for a maximum of two spaces, which would be required. Okay. Um, so, if, so if that's um, everything in your presentation, Scott, um, I would like to, um, if there's, unless there's something to add, uh, open it up now to, um, to public comment, if anybody from the public has any questions, and then we'll come back to the board for additional questions as we go along. Uh, no, I think uh, that that's all I have. <clears throat> okay. Any folks out there want to chime in? Not seeing any hands raised. There. Okay. Um. Okay. Any planning board members have any thoughts? Oh, I, George. I uh, yeah, I raised that fancy hand, huh? Um. <laughs> so I I have two questions. One is around snow removal from that tight area. How that might be managed. And also, um, I, I'm not sure if, I know it's in the downtown business, uh, not downtown, but a general business. What is, uh, what are the uh, open space requirements and what does the applicant intend to do with some of that open space that we're left with? Okay, um, George, I, I own a construction company and one of the services we perform is snow removal over the winter. We have other, uh, investment properties in town. And what we do is we remove the snow from the site if required with our skid steers and dump trucks. Uh, and I intend on that having being the case with this property. Um, we do have a certain amount uh, of area between the fence from Cumberland Farms and the end of the driveway that we can push. Uh, and if we get enough of it, we will have to remove it from the property. Um, and then regarding your question about open space, uh, there, there's very little open space, as you know, uh, to, to begin with. Um, I don't, none of our activities or improvements on the property um, 
within with with the exception of that little jog um, will be creating any less open space. Uh, and so our idea is that we would bring the front yard of True Bratton Court back to a lawn grass. And on the back of the building, it's very, very, very tight there. Uh, you're essentially looking at a 20 foot wall uh, that is Cumberland Farms and uh, it's very difficult for anything to grow back there other than weeds. Uh, and so I think what we'll do is some uh, pea stone or some, some decorative stone that would allow water to perk into the soil, but um, be a little bit more manageable than trying to grow grass, which I think would be futile. Um, aside from, from that, again, the driveway stays where the driveway is and the side of the, the building up front where we're doing some outdoor seating. Uh, I've worked with the DPW and have, in, have installed trap rock, uh, which is um, essentially what was there already. It just looks better. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. Uh, it's telling me my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully we don't lose me. Um, anybody else have any uh, questions? Chris. Hi, I'm embarrassed to say I lost my uh, bookmark of the zoning code. I'm trying to find setbacks and things uh, for this zone. Um, I'm noticing on the plan, it's not really showing any setbacks. Um, you're talking about an expanded driveway. I, I don't really know what the open space is in this zone. I'm not really seeing any dimensional um, information on the plan, and I'm doing a bad job of finding it on my own right now. Oh, so Chris, uh, don't feel bad. I actually don't think general business is up on the uh, E code for some reason. Okay. Uh, so Carolyn uh, had to give it to me. Yeah, it doesn't have its separate table, but there are no setbacks in the general business district. Okay. Um, and the open space is minimum. It's five percent, but it's over the total property. So it's not just looking at the structure and it's and it's on its own. Okay, um, then we should be good. It, it seems yeah. to me that the the new driveway will take up a lot more space than what's shown on the existing conditions plan. So I was just curious. Um, excuse me. Let let me just take a look at that. Um, no, he's talking about existing conditions. Let's just take a look. Uh, okay, for some, so the existing conditions drawing um, was, it was a survey uh, put together um, and it's not showing the driveway uh, for some reason, but it is not changing. It okay. is the same. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why he didn't, the, the, the purpose of the survey was to, um, was unrelated to Bratton Court. It's, it had to do with, I'm, it's, I'm not recalling, but when we were working on 57, 59 Main Street. And so I didn't ask the survey, the surveyor to um, get every detail. Uh, and so, um, oh, I remember because as part of our 57, 59 improvements, we are re, uh, reworking the rear egress. And of course we did the facade on the front. Uh, so he focused on that and, and for whatever reason didn't pick up the driveway. Uh, but it is it is the same. The driveway is going to be the same as it is now. Okay. Yeah, with 5% open space, I, I think you'll have that no problem. So yeah. Um, I just had a clarification just so everyone um, understands that I believe um, the tree uh, um, that um, Scott described on the front that um, he will um, uh, protect is a actually a public shade tree falls within the city's um, right of way. So as part of the application process or part of the um, construction, the applicant will have to um, comply with the um, shade uh, public shade tree protection requirements. So through the city's tree warden. Um, and so that's going to be slight that that process is slightly different. It's outside of the planning board's jurisdiction in terms of dictating or specifying, I should say, what the tree protection measures will be. So that's why my recommended recommended conditions um, 
I just noted that you know prior to construction that the applicant is to show that they've um, uh, met the criteria as specified by this um, city's tree ward for protecting that public shade tree. Sounds good. There were other like DCW same... comments as well about connections, you know, showing the details of um, utility connections, which will is sort of the normal course of work when an applicant is taking um, uh, pulling building permits. So um, those all those comments have been forwarded on to the applicant as well. Okay. Do we need to make that like do what the DPW says uh, condition, or that's just passed on? Um, yeah. So you can't say do what the DPW says because you're the planning board and you're the one that has jurisdiction about what the applicant has to do. But um, I think in terms of the shade tree, it makes sense because you also sort of you're. Um, it's not clear exactly how that protection is going to happen, but I think just sort of identifying that and the conditions that they have to take care of that in terms of the water and sewer utilities and all of that, that you don't need to make a condition about because those are city requirements anyway that are beyond your, that are outside of your purview. Got it, got it. Well, mm -hmm. I have to say, looking at the, the photos and the plans, the, the, I, I, I'm not particularly optimistic about that tree, but um, but but uh, I do I do hope it can be um, preserved uh, through this process. Um, so certainly that's an appropriate condition. Um, anybody else have any comments or thoughts or anything they'd add? I'll make a motion that close the public hearing. That's a great second. motion. Do I hear a second, Sam? Second. All right, uh, because we're on Zoom, we have to, uh, for the benefit of uh, Corinne, I'll let you know, because we're on Zoom, we have to do a roll call vote. Um, so George, how do you vote? Uh, yes. And Sam, how do you vote? Yes. David? Uh, I refuse for this one. Oh, sorry. Uh, Chris? Yes. Uh, Corinne? Yes. Krista? Yes, and I also vote yes. So we yes. are closing public comment. Sorry, uh, so, I'm buffering. That's uh, okay. Uh, so we can have uh, further discussion among the planning board if anybody has any, any last minute things to add. Um, I'm sorry. It seems like a good project. You know, we're fixing a beat up old house in Northampton, and that's a good thing. Sorry. Uh, I, I agree. I think it looks like a great project and I think it looks like, um, sorry, I was like literally uh, besieged by a child um, during Sam's comment, but I did uh, hear him say that it, it seemed like a good project and I agree. Um, and uh, I think it's, I would support it. Uh, anybody else? Um, so do I hear a motion to approve the site plan with the conditions that prior to demolition, the applicant shall sign, obtain a sign off from the city tree warden uh, related to all work in and around the city street tree? Is there any other conditions? There's uh, very little public comment or anything that came up. So I don't know. I didn't hear any other conditions. So, so if I can hear that motion. Say, say it again, Krista. Uh, so moved, I make a motion to approve this project for Kiter Builders. I don't have the thing in front of me, sorry. What Marissa said. <laughs> um, we should rarely count on that, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> second, do I have a second? <laughs> Sam, Sam gives it the thumbs up to second. All right. Second. Um, so we have a motion and a second to approve the site plan with the condition regarding the tree. So I will call the roll. Uh, George. Yes. Sam. He mouthed yes, I think. And thumbs up, okay. David is recused, Chris. Yes. Corinne. Yes. Krista. Yes. And I also vote yes. Thank you for your presentation, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, okay, uh, so we are, we can move on ahead. Don't have to fill. Um, so uh, for what well, the agenda for 720 uh, site plan um, for the city of Northampton for lot reductions to build affordable housing unit for two units on Woodland Drive uh, in Florence. And who do we have here for that? Uh, uh, Keith Benoit with the city uh, planning and sustainability. Hi, Keith. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Looks like I have the ability to do that. I think. Um, just briefly, I see a hand up. If we can uh, let the applicant, uh, if we can let Keith do his presentation and then we'll take public comment after that. Okay, excuse me for a second. I have to give a permission apparently. You need permission? No, on my computer. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> not, not, uh, no. Keith, this is a new role for you representing the office. I thought you were all things ADA for the city and accessibility. Uh, yes. Uh, that is correct, but I am, um, uh, okay, hopefully I can share now. Okay. Uh, yes. Can you see that? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So thank you all for having me. I'm throwing in uh, Wayne's on vacation. Uh, so yeah, we're requesting a lot reduction for uh, Woodland Drive uh, housing project, um, parcel ID 42-031. Um, and this is going to be um, for uh, right now it's uh, one uh, vacant property with some woods uh, and we're requesting to uh, carve it up into uh, one affordable unit that would be donated to Habitat for Humanity. That's going to be lot one, so the southern uh, lot. Uh, the left hand side is you're going to look at the, the site plan and then one market rate um, lot is going to be lot two on the northern end. Um, this is in the Water Supply uh, Protection District. Um, notably, we're also going to be kind of uh, slivering off the most northern and southern uh, sides of it to create some buffers for the other uh, nearby houses. Um, and we're going to also retain an easement on the north side. Currently, there's a small trail that's there that people on Woodland Drive can currently access. Uh, and hopefully in the future, um, we'll work with some other property owners to kind of develop that, uh, that trail further. Um, so we did have a notable uh, public engagement about this project with the residents of Woodland Drive and the, and the other abutters. Um, we had two Zoom meetings and uh, one site visit. Um, and, and right now we have an agreement uh, with the subdivision um, that the homeowners will join the homeowners, homeowners association to help with uh, snow removal and, and things like that. Um, so briefly, um, each, each one of these units, the one family, each gonna have their own um, uh, driveway. The sidewalks, the sidewalk is gonna remain. Um, and we really think that this kind of fits into the current housing that's on Woodland Drive, that kind of that rural kind of uh, more open space than you find downtown. Um, and it makes several goals, affordable housing, uh, you know, Habitat is really good at kind of creating these uh, houses that are for people low mod income uh, to buy the home. Um, and then sustainability, uh, we're going to protect a lot of the significant trees on the site. Uh, we've only uh, identified only one tree that needs to be removed. Um, and we're going the houses, when we see the site plan, you'll see they're kind of arranged for getting solar. Um, and then we're gonna uh, uh, get a dry well for capturing groundwater. Um, and again, that possible future trail connection, uh, but there is one there currently. Um, these are the dimensional requirements for the water supply district. 
Um, if you receive the site plan, this is really tiny up in the left hand corner there, but I kind of made a little. Um, but as you can see on the right hand side, it is um, it is kind of um, within the dimensional requirements for the uh, water supply district. Um, okay. Um, and we went through the um, the the uh, water supply uh, permit there, um, and we are only disturbing about thirty percent of the parcel, um, and that's that's less than an acre. So we are exempt from the stormwater performance um, and and recommendations that we made. Um, we established the path, making sure that it's ADA compliant, which um, is standard. Um, and then just that they would provide uh, construction entrance, entrance details for uh, sediment and erosion control. Um, so I'm going to blow this up a little bit if I can. So you can see. Um, so this is the this is the parcel here. Uh, this part right here, we're going to uh, sell to this uh, landowner here. This is Woodland Drive, excuse me. Uh, one, this is the proposed affordable unit, the proposed market rate. And then currently the, there's a little trail in here um, and we want to keep an easement here to possibly uh, connect to other um, resources down here. But uh, as it stands, Woodland Drive residents or people on which 66 can uh, hike in there. Um, and site plan. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of trees that are kept. These are identified uh, significant trees. Um, and uh, the way these are arrayed for solar access. Um, and most of the, most of the um, site is uh, preserved and un untouched. I believe it is 85% uh, about for both of them. Uh, so this is going to be the affordable. This will be the uh, market rate. That's why it's a little bigger. Um, but that's the extent of my um, presentation. Uh, and I'm happy to um, go back to other um, drawings or answer any questions. I have one quick question. Um, was this, this is an ANR that we saw a couple meetings ago, Carolyn, where this was a uh, current, or it was a flag lot at one time when Woodland Drive wasn't a public way. Is that correct? Um, no, this is actually on your schedule for ANR tonight because oh, okay. you can't, you can't, um, you can't review an ANR that needs additional permitting until after that additional permitting has been obtained. So mm. I can understand um, all the ANRs that have been thrown at you over the last few months. <laughs> you would um, uh, think of one of the previous ones you all did, but this one actually was, is on the list for later tonight. Um, is that the genesis of this lot though? Is this an old flag lot that it was an as a lot that um, it was left over the the subdivision for Woodland Drive was um, carved up into lots and this is leftover land that was never divided as part of that original subdivision and the builder, the original developer of the subdivision maintained ownership of this and um, the dimensional requirements changed so mm. he could not actually create a and R divisions of this last piece of property even you know, 10 years after the subdivision was built, sort of. Um, so that's why it's been sitting here um, for so many years. And um, the only way it could really be developed is, was, would be either through this um, uh, affordable housing um, um, regulations at the state, so the 40B um, provisions that allow for uh, waivers from the zoning board um 
or through now this new zoning that was adopted um, just a few months ago by city council that provides a local sort of parallel uh, approval process for um, projects that incorporate affordable housing. And so um, the uh, typically private developers can't, um, I have a hard time doing 40B projects on such a small scale. Um, so that's why this um, property was never really developed previously and why it is now able to be developed because of the um, permit review um, locally that allows for um, these waivers and, and um, from dimensional standards that are otherwise required. Um, and um, so it could either be done through the local permitting um, sort of affordable housing ordinance that we have or through the statewide 40B process. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I, I have a question about the association with this portable unit. How does that, if they're agreeing to sign in for that, like, how does the association do fees affect their ability to pay for it? Um, I believe it'll be at a, uh, a reduced rate. Um, it's not gonna be the full amount because that would be a burden uh, but we, you know, I think the agreement is to just show that they are paying into it um, so that they are, um, they are doing something. Are you guys going to work that part out, I guess, before? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any quickly, because we'll come back to uh, the planning board. Anybody on the board have any uh, initial questions before I move to public? Okay. Uh, I see somebody, uh, phone number 588-1072 has been very patiently, had their hand up for quite some time. Do you have a comment? I, maybe it's uh, inadvertent. Um, does anybody else from the public have uh, their hand up, have a comment? Okay, I, I have a question, uh, Carolyn. Um, so uh, it says conditions uh, to attach Permit so that the purchasers of the lot are are these conditions that are with the per, with the application already, or are they uh, or do we need to add them? So um, these are requirements in the zoning for any um, for any project that gets approved under the this provision in the zoning to create affordable housing and get waivers granted from the uh, from the typical sort of lot standards, however, given that um, the city is the sponsor of this permitting process and the city's not going to be building these lots, but they're going to be selling them to other people, other end users who are going to be coming in after the fact. Um, in the interest of um, making the record clear and having it run through the deed, um, I think it makes sense to just put those, reiterate the zoning requirements as a condition in the permit because that will be recorded with the deed. And so it'll be clear when the buyer comes in, but either for the market rate or the affordable lot that those requirements um, are necessary to be met the third one I think is, which I didn't have on there is just, um, which is typical when there's a tree protection area shown on the plans that that be incorporated as well into the conditions that prior to um, construction that, um, that uh, tree protection be installed and um, that the 
city that staff signs off that that's been installed in accordance with the plan. There were also some comments that came from DPW um, about some about sort of um, utility connections and where they wanted um, um, how they wanted the stubs designed. I don't think those need to be conditions. However, they also um, said uh, noted that there wasn't any um, um, essentially erosion control or tra anti tracking um, material shown for the driveway um, curb cuts. So um, uh, you all could incorporate a condition that um, materials um, during construction have to be placed so that there's no um, tracking onto the uh, public way um, during construction. Um, they also made a comment about the, and I, I don't know, Keith, you may have mentioned this and it just, I um, didn't hear it, but um, about making sure that the sidewalk crossing meets the ADA standards for the cross slope. I so, did, yes. um, yeah, so I think that should be um, added as a condition as well. Uh, the condition that the, I'm sorry, condition that the, um, cr the crosswalk. Um, so the side sidewalk, of, sorry, go ahead, Keith. <laughs> the, uh, um, the, the driveway, um, Side slope meets ADA requirements. Driveway side slope. Okay, got it. Uh, anything else from? Okay. Well, I'm gonna... I, I know this is a this is kind of a friendly application, so I hate to be this guy, but. Um, can you explain to me why uh, this this one tree um, it is infeasible to be replaced? And which law are you talking about? Uh, so there is one 21 inch tree that will be removed and not replaced per 350-6.12B3. Um, and when I when I read that section, it tells me that, and on the note too. Uh, this is on the market rate lot. It says existing significant tree one to be removed. Um, no tree replacement is proposed as no location is feasible that does not block solar PV array. So I'm just curious how there's no there's no place on this site that doesn't block the solar array. Well, I think you have uh, well the driveway is coming up. I mean, looking at it, I guess you could replace it, but um, I'm a hard time seeing it myself here. No. It seems like anywhere on the north side of the house would be an appropriate place to place trees. Well, I think is that going to be where the um, the uh, leach field is going to be? I think that's on the south side of the house. Oh, no, you're right. I, I don't have a good answer for you. Just looking at the plans now, I think the issue was, um, I'm just, I just, um, um, actually, Keith, I don't know if you have, can you put that one plan back up on the screen? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, let's see, where is it? There we go. We'll see that. So it's the tree right in the middle of the yeah. footprint of the house, basically, is the one right. in question. Yep. Right. So, um, so the, um, I think the area, um, there's a lawn area that's being created. This is the market rate lot, which you noted. Um, and on the north side, um, the, um, I think to create, uh, the space is not huge there. I think the idea was to create um, a yard area for the property, for the owner and, 
uh, for the end user. Um, and um, because this site's pretty tight in terms of how much, you know, is, is um, being carved out for the house and the, and the um, septic, the leach field, that um, they wanted to create, leave some yard area for the homeowner. And since that provision is allowable in the zoning, um, I think that's the way it was, that's why it was designed that way. If, I mean, would the city pay into its own tree fund anyway? Or is that just kind of, you know, uh, <clears throat> from one bucket to another? Yeah, um, so, uh, um, the, 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 it would be passed on to the um, to the uh, end user, um, and so it, it wouldn't be the city paying into its own, um, you know, paying itself essentially. Um, but I think the idea was, and I'm just trying to um, pull up. Um, I know we had an internal conversation about it. And I will just say, you know, yes, it's coming out of our office. I didn't personally, I haven't been personally involved in, de in this design process. Um, so trying to keep separation to the extent possible. <laughs> um, so that's why I'm just trying to go through, um, um, trying to pull up that, that information just quickly here, if you give me a second. Um, I feel like with any developer, we would say, pay us money, so. Right, however, the whole purpose of this is for the purposes of creating affordable housing. Um, and so that in itself is a benefit to the city by providing another opportunity for sort of dispersed housing. Um, and so that, is um, the that we get and remember as well that even in the sort of outside of this, when a developer comes in and, and creates affordable housing for um, and and uh, create and has to remove trees for that that fall under the standard 12.3 tree replacement calculations, there's a provision in there that the um, the uh, planning board can waive the tree replacement requirements if there are certain other benefits that are given to the city, including the provision of affordable housing units um, and including um, uh, net zero energy homes. So in this instance, it's parallel to that situation where the planning board has jurisdiction for any private developer um, to obtain that, that waiver. In this case, it's built into the zoning because this is the kind of um, project that provides um, needed housing um, in a place that, in a way, and in which other private developers can't necessarily create those units. So built into the zoning, meaning we don't they, we don't have to give a waiver. We can just um, correct. It's already part of that section six point twelve. Um, for the affordable housing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, George, your hand is raised. So, um, so kind of two things are related. I just want to follow up with, with Chris's comment. Um, but this parcel is going to be the market rate unit and the city's going to sell it to a developer who's going to build a house and make their margin. Um, so I would think that the developer could assume that cost of replacing the tree that's coming off of that lot. It's not really the city's cost at that point, um, the developers in there. And so I wondered if um, this sidewalk in front of the place, is there a tree belt that the rest of the association has put small saplings, small trees along the tree belt? There's a place that this tree, the tree money could be used um, along that tree belt. I don't see any trees uh, depicted on the plan for that area. 
Um, so just to answer that, it's already, uh, and you may have, you all may have gone out and done the site visit, it's already a pretty heavily treed street um, all along that section of woodland. Um, I can um, do a screen share and show sort of, um, it's an older, but it's a street view um, image. Um, and uh, so I don't know that they would actually um, be, I don't know if you can see that, but that's um, the Google, the street view image along this sidewalk, which is actually covered in pine needles. <laughs> um, so um, there's that piece. The other thing just to sort of um, respond, it's not really a developer who will be buying the house. It's probably an, an, a homeowner that's um, an end homeowner who might have a builder that helps them build the house, but the city is sort of the developer in this instance and has absorbed a lot of the costs already to develop the land. Um, so done the perk test, done the other sort of pre-development costs that are um, necessary to get this um, lot. And, and, our, and, and so, um, in order, we wanted to be able to recoup as much as possible. And the more expense you add onto the cost of building a house on the property, obviously it makes it more expensive for the um, buyer and then also reduces the potential value for the city to recoup from selling the parcel. Yeah, the zoning is, the zoning is very clear that no payment is required when the planting is not feasible. So uh, it seems like this is an area rich in trees. It seems like pretty clear to me that it's kind of silly to ask for another tree here. But, but I assume, David, that those trees that we're looking at, those small pines, those are all gonna come down during the uh, establishment of the site so that the folks can have lawns. Again, I, I don't see that marked on the plans, but they're gonna be all removed. I mean, and two I or three inch pines do, do not, I mean, those, yeah, I don't know. No, I so what fine. I mean, no, of course it's fine, but it's going to be a, a devoid of any, that tree canopy is going to be gone. So the absence That's not of a canopy. We don't, we, we look at significant trees. We don't look at two inch pines here. I mean, this is. No, no, I, I understand that. Yeah, they're building a house. That. It's not a forest anymore. Someone's going to build a house and there's trees around it. I mean, I'm fine it's, with that. <laughs> it, it, Exactly, but this is why the city is working hard to plant trees and tree belts now, because all of those trees will be gone in the front. So we put trees on the street there to provide some kind of shade when you're walking down a sidewalk. I think the rest of Woodland Avenue has had um, trees added along there too, because once that was all a pine forest and now it's not anymore. Um, so I'm just saying, I, I think we're missing something by not asking uh, the developers, whoever they may be, to add a couple of trees along that tree belt. So just to clarify, um, the, there's, it's not going to be clear cut along the street. There's just going to be an opening for the, uh, um, forget what the dimension is, maybe about 50 feet of width, maybe a little bit more of that to be opened for locating the house and creating enough solar gain for those units to be, you know, as close um, to um, meet the requirements in the zoning for um, fossil fuel free um, construction. And the affordable unit will have even less clearing at the street. So really the clearing is going to happen set back into the lot um, and there will be trees um, you know, protected at the street. So it's not going to be all cleared along that sidewalk. So most of that will actually remain. I, I just want to go on record as saying I'm completely fine with not requiring them to replace trees, but not for that call out that it's, you know, not practical. I think we could certainly do that under 350-12.3 significant trees, 6A1, a, affordable housing units where 50% or more of the units are deed restricted for affordable housing as defined in this chapter 350. So this is half the units, one out of two are affordable housing. So we can certainly decide not to do it. But as long as we're deciding not to do it for the right reason, not the wrong reason.
Um, I don't know that they're two units. They're two parcels. So the whole project falls under 6.12 affordable housing because that's the thing that allows the reduction in lot dimensions, which is what creates these lots. And 6.12 is, is um, what is applicable, not 12.3, the significant trees, because 6.12 is where the waiver for tree replacement comes in. I had just noted under 12.3, there's it's sort of a parallel evaluation that the board can make. Um, oh, but, but that's a special permit? That's special permit, whereas in 12.3 under section B, when significant trees on a property are cut, they shall be uh, replaced on site with new trees to the extent feasible without blocking PV or hot water systems, but no payment in lieu of is required when such planting is not feasible. Um, and, uh, but it's obviously not applicable to public shade trees, which is the last part of that um, statement. So that's a, the juristic, that's the piece of the zoning that is applicable in this situation. Right. Um, and so the, in, in the application, that's what's noted is that the way that this is designed sort of tightly around creating an opening for these two units, it comes as a package, even though one, you know, so 50% means one unit is not and the other unit is affordable, but it's the whole package that you're looking at um, under this provision. But as we don't have to add a condition regarding the tree at all, because of the way the permit is, um, unless somebody wants to add a condition that says that they, they do need to replace the tree, um, I would uh, like to move on from this discussion. <laughs> Second. <laughs> With due respect, Chris. <laughs> um, so um, if I'm stating that correctly and I understand that um, correctly, um, I would like to ask one more time if there's anybody in the public that has a comment about this. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So do I hear, um, and I wanna make sure, does, it, does the planning board have any more questions for the applicant? No. Okay, with that said, do I hear a motion to close public comment? No. Okay. Any second, Sam? Sam gives me the thumbs up second. All right, uh, so I'm gonna vote, David. Yes. George. Um, just a teeny bit of discussion before we close the public hearing. Okay. Sometimes we do that. Okay. Um, I just need to clarify this uh, uh, condition number three about the, the, the ADA slope where the sidewalk meets the driveway. Just for future hearings, I don't quite understand that. This is a flat parcel. Could you go through that one more time for me, Carolyn or uh, Keith? What is this about a slope? Um, it's the cross slope. So it's not, it's um, so that it basically stays level. It's not, I mean, yes, this is relatively flat. It's really just making sure that the, um, that in the reconstruction of the driveway, that when the driveway crosses a sidewalk, that it's not, a new slope isn't created that, um, it, that doesn't meet the ADA standards. And do we do do we note this on every new driveway that's created that comes across the sidewalk? Is it somewhat <laughs> it's standard? A, <laughs> it's a good question. I wouldn't say that you necessarily have to note that because really it's it's in our it's our street standards. Um, so I it's it probably does fall into the category of more of a heads up, like you need to make sure you're maintaining this. Um, but um, so you actually, if you feel that you don't want to incorporate it as a condition, because it's true, we don't, if you don't, let me put it this way. If it's not part of the condition, it doesn't mean the applicant doesn't have to meet it. <laughs> they still need to meet that um, requirement. Um, I think, it's just being, a, you know, adding a layer of um, additional notice and conditioning in this case. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to start that vote again. <laughs> um, Excuse so we, me. Okay, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Um, there's a few of us from Woodland. Yep. There's a few of us from Woodland Drive. We lost power up here. And it just cut back our power within the last 10 minutes. Some of us, so I know David, I think, had it. We can't um, really hear you. So, um, Mr. Um, Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, if you can hear us, can you, Mr. Kennedy. And I, I, he's talking, but I, none of us are hearing him. Um, I don't know. Okay, so I, yeah, so I see a number of people uh, sort of came in in the middle of that. Were they all people here for the wood? Uh, I'm sorry. So were these folks who were here for the for the uh, woodland? Or not? So it sounds like they lost he power. Sent a note to everyone that said he and just came back on. To leave a comment. So, Mr. Kennedy, we can't hear you, and I think somebody else needs to speak yeah. because we just can't hear you. Can we move to continue this public comment period to yeah. the after the next one, so these folks can get online and and make their comment? I don't want to close it before we hear from them, but it's yeah, not really working right now. I don't either, and I don't have a sense of how many people are. I, I, Mr. Yeah. Kennedy, we can't hear you. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna. I don't. I don't. Oh, he's muted. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I we don't want to cut anybody off, but it's, it's not. It, I feel like there's other people trying to speak too, or having the same internet difficulties. Uh, Tom. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm in Woodland Drive, and uh, we had power out from about seven, shortly after seven until 7.55, and this is Woodland Drive is where, I don't know if you're at that point, or is that still on the agenda, but I think probably almost everyone from Inland Drive who wanted to get in wasn't able to get in. Oh, that, yeah, I, I hear that. Um, you know what, I, that's a big issue. I, that's, a, that's a real problem. Um, I, I would propose that we... Um, uh, I would propose that we continue this. Um, I hate that we went through the whole presentation um, and had some discussion, but I I saw an influx of of people, and it appears that a number of them are, were here for this hearing, weren't able to get on because of the weather. Um. Uh. And well, so I, I see okay. Chris nodding their head. I um I, I feel I feel like we just need to call an audible here and 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 continue. Um, I'm a, I move uh, that we go for it. Can I ask? Oh, can I ask a question? Do you want? Are you talking about moving it to the end of the meeting? Um, so, like in another hour or something? No, no. We just need to move it to next to next meeting. I think okay. we need to move it to next meeting because it's very unclear to me. It seems clear that a number of people didn't hear the presentation at yeah. all, and. <laughs> And um, Can you hear me now? No, we're moving no. it. I, I move that we move the the woodlawn thing till next to next meeting. A second. No, so, no, hold so on. Let me hold just on. Clarify. We have a we have a motion on the floor so to close the public hearing. So why don't we just vote down that motion? Okay. And then we can make another motion to move it. If somebody interrupts the vote with a with a, a prolonged discussion, does that uh, what does that do to the uh, vote? <laughs> well, you said you were going to restart the vote anyway, Marissa. So. I did say I was going to restart the vote. I thank you for for clarifying. I changed my vote and keeping us on track. I say, David, do you vote to close the public? Comment? No. George. No. Uh, Chris. No. Corinne. No. Sam. No. Krista, no. <laughs> I also vote. I vote no. I vote no. I move. I, I move. I, I move to move, move the meeting to August or 
What, when was, when's the next meeting? So the next I think. meeting is September 9th. No, you don't 26. have uh, um, a meeting the 26th. However, if you wanted to, no. you could certainly move it to the 26th, but you haven't previously scheduled a meeting. September, I moved the, moved the meeting for September 9th. Well, let me ask, uh, let me ask uh, Keith, um, is there anything about this uh, that that be that a, a delay of a few weeks is going to uh, cause a big issue? No, uh, it's good. Okay. Um, I, and listen, I I want to I, I want to I feel like this was a civic moment in action, and I really appreciate uh, the 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 neighbors and the people who came uh, for this part of the hearing uh, for speaking up. Um, we knew the weather was an issue tonight, and uh, it's unfortunate that was your specific neighborhood that that uh, was was, you know, uh, lost power for an, a more extended period of time. So um, Sam has a motion to move this item to the agenda for September 9th to complete this discussion. A second. At 7 p.m., uh, I think, is that, you need to do a time specific. At 7 p.m., okay. So September 9th at 7 p.m., um, Sam moved and I, who, who seconded? Chris. Chris, okay, all right. So um, thank you all for speaking up, folks. Um, I will take the vote. David. Yep. Vote. George. Yes. Chris. Yes. Corinne. Yes. Sam. Yes. Krista. Yes. And I also vote yes. And now everybody tuck it away and then we can review uh, the minutes uh, for the discussion so that when we come back on the ninth, it'll be a... And, and we can ask the applicant to do an expedited review of the application again on the ninth. Do we have to start? I think you'll have to do that actually, okay. because people, uh, it looks like people missed a chunk of it. So I think it's just cleaner to do that. Cool. Right. And thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so we, we appreciate your presentation and uh, we know it'll be just as good the next time. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, which leads us to um, major site plan by David Box and live give play for a five story multi use apartment building at 79 King Street. Yes, uh, this is David Fox. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, our business is called uh, Live Give Play. Uh, we're targeting active adults, 55 plus, and I want to explain our name. Uh, we want to be able to live in a mass timber building that is a passive house with a solar roof and uh, a green roof, and we want to have shared electric cars. Uh, we want to be part of the community and give back by mentoring students and local entrepreneurs, by participating in local nonprofits, and we want to be able to play in Northampton as you guys do, uh, hiking, biking, all the live events, theater, music, lectures, the sporting events, the great art. Um, and we hope to accomplish this at uh, the 79 King Street location uh, as an urban infill project in a very walkable neighborhood and bring in approximately 66 households of people who will contribute to the community, both by giving back and economically by spending money there. So uh, to explain more about the project, I'd like to turn this over to Jeff Squire of Berkshire Design Group to talk about the site plan and David Kubik of BKSK Architects to talk about the proposed building. Thank you. Great, thanks, David. Um, this is Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group. Uh, Chris Chamberlain is also here from our office. Um, I'm actually on vacation in the Northern Adirondacks, so this is gonna be sort of a tag team effort with, with Chris and I. Um, if Chris has got uh, sharing capabilities, I'll walk you through the plans. Um, but as David mentioned, um, this project is, uh, is located at 50, uh, 79 King Street. Um, it right now is currently occupied by roughly 2,600 square foot uh, real estate office. Uh, this used to be uh, the former uh, bank branch for Bank of America. And prior to that, it was a service station. Uh, um, um, so that, that site has been developed for, for a number of years. Um, the, there, are two, there were two 
curb cuts on the existing site. There's there's one on the north side of the site. Um, there's also remains of what used to be a, a second curb cut further on the south. Um, the, the current real estate office um, closed that curb cut informally, um, not without curbs and, and stuff along King Street, but that's no longer a, a drive access. And then behind a the lot is, or behind the building is a large existing parking lot. Um, almost to the, to the rear of the site where there's a little bit of green space as it abuts the, uh, where abuts the bike path and the, the railroad tracks. Um, the proposal is to demolish the current building um, and develop a five story, um, roughly 109,000 gross square foot building. Uh, it's roughly uh, 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 5,900 square feet on the ground floor. The front of the building um, facing King Street is, um, would be occupied by a uh, retail floor on the ground level um, and then uh, residential units above. And then the back of the building contains um, underground parking or not underground, but uh, first floor parking for 65 uh, cars and then residential units above. And the resident res residential units are a mix of one, two and three bed room uh, apartments and studios. Um, so the parking uh, access into the site, uh, as I said, comes in from the existing curb cut off of King Street on the north side of the property. Um, it extends under an underpass under the under the building and turning right would bring you into the uh, lower level parking garage. Um, there is a start uh, stacked car system in that um, in the garage floor to hold, uh, hold roughly 65 cars. And then the exit um, is a little bit further to the east and there's a one-way exit that wraps around and exit back out on King Street um, via that single curb cut. Um, the parking, um, just some of the other site amenities that I will mention while this plan is up, or actually, Chris, if you would go back to the uh, rendering just for a minute, that's great. Um, so fifth floor along King Street, uh, there is a uh, an amenity roof, which includes um, some club space, you know, a roof deck, roof deck, and um, a, a catering kitchen, and and a place to service some events um, on that on that front on the top floor overlooking King Street with views to the Holyoke Range, and then behind that, there's also an extensive green roof for for residents, which which would also include a number of amenities and and um, you know seating options. And then behind that is uh, a, a roof-mounted solar arrays, which would um, which would be for the building uh, power. Um, there's also uh, EV chargers proposed for electric vehicles um, on the on the parking level. Um, and as as David mentioned, this this building is seeking passive house certification. Um, it is it is a mass timber building, um, so we are striving to to tick all the boxes in terms of sustainability ability and um, um, you know current um, current con current construction practices that um, you know are, are attentive to you know some of the environmental concerns um, lastly and then behind the building we've all also got a bike storage uh, an independent bike storage building for bicycles a little park area and connections to the bike path uh, again in, in the eastern part of the property this path connection would continue along the south side of the building and the property to join up with King Street. So there's an independent pedestrian connection um, that would uh, avoid the need to utilize the, the parking and, um, and the vehicle lanes. And that would extend all the way out to, to the King Street, uh, King Street sidewalk. Um, the, the ground floor level along King Street, just to mention, um, we are set back about 10 to 14 feet from the side, uh, from the street line. Um, again, really trying to create, um, you know, some space out in front of those retail stores, retail spaces um, to, you know, accommodate, you know, maybe outdoor dining or outdoor displays, depending on what those, uh, who those future tenants are. Um, but the idea is just really to leave that open as, as flexible space and, and be utilized um, depending on, on the tenant's needs. Um, fire access, we have reviewed uh, these plans extensively with the 
fire department um, included in the submission package was uh, was a letter from um, or memo from fire some fire code consultants um, regarding fire safety and and um, access. So that was included. Um, with respect to site lighting, um, the, we're not proposing any new site lights, um, uh, pole mounted lights. The, um, the site is, is um, again, in, in the sort of core downtown district, there's a lot of ambient light. We are proposing um, flush mounted step lights uh, along the building along the south side to light the pedestrian path. And then we've got some smaller bollards um, in the back of the, uh, in the back of the building around the park area, and then some of the sidewalk connections and to provide um, you know, wayfinding tool for, um, for people exiting the, the parking garage back out onto King Street. But again, we, re we really are trying to um, you know, minimize the amount of uh, site lights and site lighting that we need um, and feel that those, those low level lights will, um, you know, will provide uh, you know, ample, ample light for, for safety and, and um, the users. Um, with respect to trees, there are um, there are a handful of trees uh, that exist on the property. The majority of them um, are on the rear of the property. Um, all of the ones, with the exception of that cluster right in the middle there, we are proposing to to maintain at least in terms of the significant trees. Um, the majority, if not all of those, are all black locusts. Um, and you know, while they are considered invasive, we are trying to maintain that tree cover, uh, particularly on the eastern portion of the site to the extent possible, recognizing that it plays a significant buffer um, from residents and from other properties. And then as Chris just circled, there's another tree just north um, on the church property um, that is another locust that we are also proposing to keep. Um, and um, recognizing that construction does get relatively close to some of those, um, we you know also recognize that the the uh, black locusts in particular are are extremely durable and and, and rugged trees. Um, so at least from a a tree survival standpoint, um, you know at least I'm. Um, you know, as a horticulturist, I'm not too concerned about the, the ability of those black locusts to survive a little bit of, um, you know, construction disturbance along one side. Um, Stormwater, um, I guess you go to the utility plan. I'll just run through um, the system real quick. Um, the majority of the site um, is being handled through a couple of uh, subsurface detention systems. Again, the existing site right now is predominantly um, predominantly paved. We are, we are slightly exceeding the amount of impervious area, but with the green roof and some of the other um, amenities, um, we're, we're, we're pretty close to, to balancing the site. In terms of stormwater runoff, we are providing um, a subsurface system in the rear of the site. Um, as you can see, that will collect um, some of the roof water and, um, and some of the, the, the dirty water from the you know, the drive lanes and parking areas, um, but otherwise most of the existing connections and, and services out onto King Street will be, um, will be retained for, um, for some of the overflows. Um, similarly, sanitary sewer is available right out in the street. Um, water is, is available. Uh, we have reviewed these plans with the DPW. Um, I know there were some comments received back um, Happy to walk through those. Most of them um, seem pretty straightforward, but um, again, Chris or I are happy to run through um, any of those comments or questions that the board may have. Um, other details. Um, <clears throat> I think um, I think at this point, maybe going into some of the architectural drawings might be might be useful. And David, if you want to uh, just run through those quickly, um, I would open it up to, to any questions or comments. Um, sure, thanks, Jeff. I'm David Kubik with BKSK Architects. Um, try to keep this portion a little bit more brief, but just to run through from an orientation point of view, this is the ground floor. Again, you can see that light blue area here on the left is the retail facing King Street on the left of this plan. Um, that sort of pink room in between is the residential lobby serving all of the dwelling units above. And then the sort of tail of the building, if you will, in gray, 
is the on-grade parking, um, first floor parking area that Jeff was talking about. You can see the two lane um, drive off King Street where you turn right, come through and then go back out the, the one lane exit. Um, and there are some mechanical rooms and fire stairs kind of tucked back there um, in the corner. Um, shall we go to, this is just a mezzanine plan. Yeah, we can skip that. Um, um, this is basically the typical floor for the second through fourth floor. Um, there, it's basically a double loaded corridor with different unit types. Um, you can see the changes in tone from one bedrooms to two bedrooms, three bedrooms and studios. Um, two main elevators at the front of the building with two fire stairs and a third fire stair with some daylight into the corridor in the rear of the building. You can go to next one, which is just the top floor, the fifth floor of the building. Um, the residential units continue to stack for the rear part, portion of the building, but in the front is an amenity space for the building, a kind of um, club space for the residents. There's small catering kitchen, bathrooms, a kind of library and lounge space um, at the northern end, and a small terrace that you can walk out onto there facing south um, with views towards downtown. And then on top of that is the main roof of the building. Um, which will have a series of different uses, but kind of a green roof amenity space for the residents, mechanical and solar array towards the back of the building and some more probably um, landscaped and hardscaped furnished area of the roof um, facing King Street. The elevators come up to the roof with a small lobby um, and the fire stairs serve the roof as well since occupants will be up here. Um, we've already, made our presentation to the architectural review board. This is just a slide um, talking about some of the precedents in town in terms of architectural language, window sizes, masonry patterns, um, cornice detailing, go ahead and skip. Um, this is the main elevation facing King Street. So you can see the retail area, the main entry to the residential lobby on the right-hand corner and that amenity club space on the, on the fifth floor taking a slightly different reading. Than the apartments in the in the middle. Uh, this just has a few more dimensions. I think you can skip that. Um, these are the north and south elevations. Um, the south elevation here at the top of the page. Um, again, just the second through fourth floor, fifth floor looking a little different when it faces King Street on the left, um, and then the um, north elevation at the bottom of the page. Um, you can see the fire stair with its glass on the left hand side, the two garage doors at the ground floor. Um, and again, that club space on the fifth floor facing King Street. Um, this is the east elevation, if you will, facing the bike path. Um, and then just a detail of one bay um, to show some of the architectural details that we were proposing that we shared on committee meeting. Um, perspectives on King Street from the north. You can see the entry, the two lane entry and how that goes under the building with the retail off to the right. Um, and you can see sort of the tail of the building beyond to the left in this rendered view. And this, this just taken from the south, you can see the kind of open little arcade space that you walk through where these two people are. That's how you walk into the residential entry to the lobby of the building and, and then the retail there. Just a rendered view from the front. Um, and then these two pages are just axonometric views just to help with a general orientation, but all things you've seen. Yep. That's it. Any questions? I'm happy to help. Yeah. Boy, nobody's done anything this big in Northampton in a long time. <laughs> it's pretty exciting to see. Um, uh, just actually one other zoning um, thing. Can you scroll down on this site plan a tiny bit? Yeah. Um, Jeff mentioned that we're setting our building back further from the property line. There's a little bit of an open space there. And the, the intent, um, actually, even just the rendered site plan was just to align the front of our building with um, the, our neighboring building to the south in terms of how we arrived at that location. 
was was a uh, partly influenced by the the town's design guidelines with the transitional residential building diagrams where if you have a neighbor that's slightly set back that you know you you could match that just for consistency on the streetscape that's what informed that line sorry <laughs> Um, okay, so if that uh, concludes your uh, presentation, I uh, first I'll go to the uh, to the to the board. Does anybody have any initial questions before we go to public comment? Can, and I can can't really. A quick question. Ahead, Just there was some mention about the. Uh, uh, it was referred to in a few different ways, but the club roof. Uh, being a public is, uh, can you just describe how that club level below and the club roof are, are meant to be used? So they're accessory to the building. They're an amenity space for the residents. Okay, so it's not public, it's private. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Um, all right. Sounds like the board's pretty quiet right now. Um, any public comment? Anybody from the public here to chime in? I don't know if we want to put it back in gallery view. I can't really, unless they raise their hand. Okay, so I'm not seeing anybody. So I'll go back to the to the board right now. I, I think my um, uh, I do I do appreciate that it, I at the, I was very excited about the electric car share and then um, to see one parking spot for 65 or whatever it is different uh, units uh, sort of seems to be contrary to that uh, and doesn't encourage the kind of uh, uh, move away from cars that I would hope, but um, that's that's just a comment. Um, anybody else on the board have any thoughts or? Uh... Yeah, maybe I missed the, uh, I missed that part. So is this, they're sharing cars? I was just curious how the parking works because it looks like there's um, like car stacking on that ground level parking. And I was curious if there was, you know, if this was like one parking spot per unit, you know, that's not required. Um, and how that would happen with if one car stacked above the other car. Uh, yes, um, we intend that we'll have five or six community cars to start and that people will uh, pay the same for parking, whether it's a gas or an electric car. So essentially they're getting the charging for free uh, relative uh, to if they have a, a conventional car and they can put that car also in a, into a pool. So when they're not using it, other people in the community can use it. Uh, and there are professional organizations that run these type of things. Um, and to the earlier comment, um, we have to come to, uh, to face the, the, the truth that people who have two cars on a suburban 4,000 square foot house and they're downsizing the city, we don't think they're gonna go to zero cars. Uh, we think we can get them to one car with the other one being shared. But believe me, we're gonna to try to eliminate as many car spaces as possible based on demand because the extra spaces cost us $50,000 a space. We could have 35 spaces and save ourselves over a million dollars. So I have to, as a marketer, assume that the suburban baby boomer couple downsizing with two cars are not gonna give up both cars. I hope that's, not the case that they'll give up both cars, uh, but I, I can as a marketer plan that they will. I'm, I'm not claiming that this is my purview, but I'm just curious, how, how does that work if, um, I just don't understand. It seems like one unit would need to have two cars if, you're if one's gonna be on an elevator above the other one. How would you claim oh, that? that? That I can address. The, the stacker system is self-parking and um, there's always one empty module in the bank. So it's basically like a game of Tetris kind of. Um, if your car is at the top, you can press a couple buttons and the thing moves your car down because there's always one empty shuffle space. Um, 
So it, it's not attendant parking, it's, it's a self parking system and you'll have your code and, and you can always retrieve your card and, at any moment. You're not reliant on the person below you. Okay, so it's kind of like a dry cleaner or a yeah, kind of like that yeah. CD changer, not yeah. not like a bunch of little elevators next right. to it. Right. Okay. Right. Well, that's that's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question I had, and I think DPW brought this up too. I'm just a little concerned about the sight distance coming out of that as you're pulling out of the underpass. Um, number one, kind of clearing that brick. Uh, column or wall or, or whatever and then also right. with that on-street parking spot so i was wondering if you guys could address kind of sure so i like. think um we were pretty comfortable with it for a couple of reasons one um there is the five foot sidewalk that's outboard of the property line and then we're further set back even from the property line so there's sort of a double sidewalk moment um and then as, as you pointed out there's even a parking lane so there's a fair amount of sort of layers and distance back to that brick pier. And we even checked that for the fire department radius, you know, that they can get in. And it was compliant even for that radius. So um, we felt that there was um, definitely enough room there that you could you could poke your car out without even disturbing the that last five foot sidewalk and be able to see. Um, so that felt that felt right to us. Were there are or are there ongoing discussions with DPW about that on-street parking spot between you and the church? Uh, not I, I, in the loop on that, Jeff, do you know? Yeah, I, I know there was a question about, um, you know, what would how, what would the site distance, how would, how would the site distance improve if one of those parking spaces was removed? Um, and I think, you know, Chris, you might be able to speak to it more, but I know we did look at that and um, it, it really doesn't improve it that much more and it's consistent with, you know, what's what we are proposing is consistent with, you know, what's going on up and down, you know, all of the driveways along King Street there. Okay. Yeah, and so I believe the, if I remember correctly, the, the traffic uh, analysis showed that uh, looking to the north uh, was not quite compliant, but better. It's really the south direction that was the issue. Um, and we did look at uh, if parking spaces were removed. And with the geometry of King Street and the number of spaces there, you'd actually have to remove quite a few of them um, before you start to really make gains in that distance. And uh, importantly, the stopping site distance for traffic uh, approaching a vehicle that stopped waiting to turn in was uh, met the design guidance in both directions. Um, but as, as Jeff mentioned, um, ultimately, this driveway is going to be a lot like Allen Place, which is where our office is that we pull out of, and uh, um, Trumbull Street, uh, and to a lesser extent, a few of the other driveways um, in terms of that, that parking lane is there and, and is something that, uh, that we have to deal with at, at all of those intersections through that area. Uh, George, you've had your hand up for a minute. Thanks. Um, I just want to go back to Mr. Fox's comment about, you know, they're one of the real emphasis is to try to get people to not have two cars when they come and move in there, which is great. I think uh, we certainly want to encourage that. So, and my assumption is with people 55 and older, a lot of them are going to have bicycles. So maybe instead of a car, each unit might have a bicycle. So let's say the, even half of the units have a bicycle. So 30 or 40 bicycles on the property. Um, there are some bike lockers in the back, but where do you anticipate people will keep their bicycles? Do they have storage spaces? There's no room outside. So the Just wondered. Yeah, we um, both Jeff and I can probably speak to that. So there is a little shelter, bike shelter in the in the back, which is what you're seeing on that site plan. Um, and I'm looking at my notes here, which I think are current. I think that shelter that we picked holds about uh, <laughs> 25 or 30 bikes right Jeff, do you recall yeah it's it's close to 30 32 bikes yes okay good luck with that you know i hope people don't mind keeping their bikes out there even though it's covered that'll be great i anticipate some will be downstairs too but um and while we're on the topic of bikes so that connector from the bike lane along the <clears throat> south side of the building how wide is that? It's referenced a couple of times as a pedestrian path rather than a, a multi-use path. 
It's um, so our building is set back from the property line seven feet. Um, and so there'll be a, you know, a minimal steel railing at the edge of that. So, you know, a few inches less than seven would be the width for that path. From the face of that building, the side of that building to the metal railing. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> will the uh, will the property be fenced in any fashion for security purposes? No, there's no okay. proposal right now. <clears throat> okay. All right. Great. Well, there's been a couple of times in our city's history when we've had an egress or, or an opening from the street to the back of the property to the bike path to another street. Um, and in due time, the uh, the owner of the property decided to close off that access point. Um, so I certainly hope that that wouldn't be the situation here. If you start seeing too much traffic of non-residents going down that walkway. Yep, yeah, just, we... just a comment to be sure. aware of, yeah. Yep. Thank you. And then uh, George, I'll just throw in that because I ride my bike through that connector to work every day. So if, if David closes it, he's going to hear from me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there's also the connection through the church parking lot, which is frankly, even today, uh, that's the way that I come into work because it's a lot easier. And that that's set to remain. You're right. Thanks. We also, we're also not proposing any residential units on the ground floor. So you know, sometimes those adjacencies can get tough, but we don't really have that problem. Um, so that's a good thing, I suppose. Uh, Tom, Mr. Uh, Rolick. Yes, I'm, forgive me if you mentioned this earlier and I missed it, but are any allowances made for visitor parking? Or are they just supposed to park on the street if these people have people over for dinner and such and that kind of thing? Uh, we haven't thought that through, to be honest. Uh, it's a good question. Um, but uh, we haven't uh, really met and contracted with the automatic parking people yet. So it, it, it's an open uh, question and I think it's a good one and I'll keep that in mind. I just don't have an honest answer right now. And Thank we you. can throw in that there is, um, there are daytime long-term spaces close by, including on Gothic Street and just a little bit up King Street. And then there's the, I think it's called the St. James lot, but a public parking lot just at the other end of Allen Place, which is directly across the street. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Marissa, I just, and the board, I just had a comment related to the bike access and of course um, parking, um, just moving, starting backwards. We don't have a requirement for visitor parking. In fact, there's no minimum parking required at all for um, new construction in, in central business. So the applicant definitely is not obligated to create any, any parking and uh, let alone visitor parking. Um, so, uh, the, but in terms of the bike path access, there was a question that um, I had sent to the applicant and I don't know if Chris and Jeff, you had a chance to think about that, but you're creating a bike path connection that's coming alongside the building, but then it's dumping into the sidewalk and there's no ramp onto King Street. So um, if you could just clarify that and whether or not, um, the um, you know bicycles aren't allowed on the sidewalks. So I don't know where people were planning to enter the street at that point. So at least that bike path right now comes into the King Street sidewalk, right where the driveway for um, uh, Wayland Insurance is, just to the south. So there's a portion of that that driveway that is is partially shared by um, um, by Wayland. So the intent is going to be that 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 portion of bike path as it comes in there will be you know flush with the um adjacent driveway and come into um come into the king street sidewalk um yeah fl flush so we don't really need we didn't really expect to need a, a, a ramp in that location we weren't going to put um you know we didn't anticipate needing a ramp out onto king street because the um because of the, the the curb cut that's right there, um, if that's if that's the ramp that you were referring to. Yeah, so I guess it's just the inconsistency that renderings often create. Is sure. um, it doesn't show that on the rendering, but clearly on the site plan it shows. But, that. And that, but there's an existing curb cut there, so presumably we could just put a four or five foot curb cut or seven foot. I guess is that the, that's what the clearance is. Uh, 
to encourage people to, I mean, it is a little bit confusing in here, encouraging people to sort of cross a, a, a neighboring property's drive aisle, and, you know, if you already have a curb cut, I mean, I don't know how that works on the zoning, but if you have it already, couldn't you just keep it? Right, and so no. that's that's the intent, is that that curb stone now on the north side of that curb cut is gonna get narrowed slightly, but that curb opening will still remain and that would function as, oh, you know, okay. as a way for bicycles to come out, right. Okay, yeah, I misunderstood. Gonna, okay, good. We're not gonna close good. the curb cut to the south. On the south, okay, good. Yeah, it was a little unclear. What Jeff meant is that the curb cut is shared between Whalen and the former driveway that used to be here. It's getting smaller. Yes. Right. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And can yeah, I think be marked as sort of a bike lane or bike ramp. Um, to, it can be. I mean, we're, the proposal is to use, you know, is to is to use concrete as a material, as you know, as one indicator to separate it from the. You know the adjacent bituminous, you know driveway. Um, you know there is there is a uh, the visitor entrance, the resident entrance is just to the left of that sort of central dividing um, partition there, and then further you know further back along the pedestrian path, there there's eventually a retaining wall and a and a guardrail, um, but there's probably a way you know with signage or something on on the building that we could indicate. You know that that's a pedestrian path to the to the bike path. Yeah, I would I would encourage. It's like you a to very confusing area there. You have vehicular traffic coming on to a multimodal path with a pedestrian entrance to your building. That's a that's a big mess of of you're mixing a lot of things right there. Well, part part of the issue, part of the challenge is that that curb cut to Whalen Insurance right now is partially on the 79 King Street property. And that's the only access we have to that. That's the only access to that to that parcel. And we can't we can't eliminate that curb cut. So what we were proposing to do was to, you know, at least clarify, you know, where the sidewalk, you know, through a, a, a change of material where the sidewalk is. And then as the building architecture comes down and, you know, plays a more important role along that you know, um, along that edge, that it would it would define you know the various entrances to both the retail, the residential, and then the views to the path. You know, continuing back to the rear of the property. Right. I mean, I, I no, yeah, nobody ever, nobody suggesting you lose keeping the curb cut seems obviously needed. I guess my, my thing is 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 the is bicycle use of this combined area because that's that's where the um, the kind of collisions with pedestrians coming in and out and then and then cars um you know also using that driveway um so i see the constraints uh that's you know and what you're trying to do there with the mixed material use i think some additional uh markings on the on the on the ground or you know i think are going to be pretty necessary to you know keep people mindful of where they're going and, and and what different modalities people are getting around on there. Yes. Yeah, so, so can you just clarify where it says start concrete retaining wall and metal guardrail? It starts there and moves to the northeast and to the southwest. There is no rail. Is that correct? Correct. No railing. Okay. There's what we call a line weight issue there. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. There's, there's yeah, that, that heavy line here just there. represents the property line. Yeah, yeah I figured, right, line. but you're doing a lot on the property line, so. <laughs> yeah. right. um, um, and maybe it, maybe it helps to clarify, this is a one-way entrance, correct, into Wayland's insurance? I, uh, I don't know, to be honest. I don't uh, think it is. I, I thought, think that's the only entrance to that. Well, they have a loop around their building. There is, and I there think is another they have drive a, in the south. I think yeah, they have a one-way. There's way a big in. arrow there. Yeah. One way in. So uh, this is, I. This is, this is so Peter I think Whalen. that um, it, it would be helpful to clarify the width that's being intended to be the drive aisle width, because I think the whole dimension you're showing is 20 feet wide. But um, if there's a way that it could be delineated, that the difference between the in 
found one way in uh, for vehicular movement versus the two way potential of bicycle access. Peter was Gonna say so the, so the paved so the paved what we're leaving as the paved driveway coming in is roughly you know 12 feet at its narrowest um you know part of the challenge is we can't narrow that curb opening too much because then it doesn't satisfy the fire access needs and that was you know part of the issue that we had on our site um with that turning radius so um you know part of part of the goal with this is to try and um causes least disruptions to that that driveway as possible yet recognize that um you know through a change of materials and other pieces that there would be some indicators on the ground and otherwise that you know there you're approaching you know you're approaching king street and um you know you need to you need to be cautious just like coming out of any other you know side street or or building onto onto king street i, I guess i feel like you'd be better off with it being more asphalt as an indicator to people that cars are going to be driving here instead of making it all concrete and they'll uh, I, I, I totally disagree. I think we're trying to make this less of a, a car environment. I think I think the the connection to the bike path at Live 155 or Live 155 or whatever it's called is a pretty similar condition where you have kind of a small plaza area and the bike path goes this way and the entrance goes that way. And I think cars respond to a change in cars drive slower when it's not asphalt. And I, I, I would, uh, I would do a little more with signage. Like maybe the, I think it's also like maybe a problem having the bike racks not on the bike path access because that's sort of the natural place to want to put your bikes. But it is pretty cramped here, so I don't know that you can fix that. Uh, this is I'm Peter Whalen. To... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, can I? Can I, I? I would like to let Sam talk. He's been trying to I, make a comment, I, I, and I'd then say, we'll come I, back to I, you, I, Mr. Whalen. I'd really like to hear what Peter Whalen was going to say because it's okay. a piece of property. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, that's fine. Thank, thank you. Uh, that is a one-way uh, driveway. That's the entrance because there's a, a an, an outbound lane on the south side of the building. Um, having having said that, despite several large white painted arrows indicate clearly indicating it's just an entrance. Some people do go out there, um, and I've tried to change that for. 30 years and it's not quite work, but the vast majority of people do behave. I think uh, I think there's a, about to be a, a big brick edifice to remind people. Okay. <laughs> Coming back to something we were talking about in the last application about keeping across an 88 car slope on the sidewalks. I mean, this is kind of like one of the worst sidewalk conditions in the city. Uh, if anyone's ever had the pleasure of driving to Foster Farrar, uh, you know, that's the kind of ultimate cross slope. Um, so what, what I can't really read on the grading plan, though, is there any way you can even deal with that, given how high everything is there? Yeah, so one of the ways we, we dealt with that here is we've, we've, we've met the grades at the back of the sidewalk that runs along King Street, which, you know, as you know, is, is flat. Um, and so we've maintained that grade um, and then rising, you know, at, at no more than 2% up to the retail entrance. And, um, you know, essentially the, the retail floor um, or ceiling height is taller in the front of the building than it is in the rear of the building because we we have some additional grade there to make floor level down is what we needed to do to meet the sidewalk so you brought the first floor level down there to make less of a slope at that less, side. less of a slope exactly okay what about on the north side same thing the north side well so there's no connection between the retail space and the the rear of the building that the tail that David was re referring to so that central lobby space really is where a lot of that grade change can happen so that garage floor elevation sits up a little bit higher and just, so you still drive up into the site but the retail level is down lower i just mean the sidewalk here at the north curb cut uh yeah david is it, I, is it the cross slope is I, good I, yeah i think i follow what you're saying and so Anytime you have a sidewalk um, right along the curb, it's a challenge to yeah. make these driveways work. And, and I'll tell you, it takes a lot of time actually to actually grade these out with spot grades and everything for the final design. But the, you know, sort of philosophically, the way I approach this is the ideal condition is that there's no change in grade for the person using the sidewalk and no change in material. 
Now that's not possible literally in a situation like this. So what we do to compromise is we start by making sure that the sidewalk is elevated some from the street with a sloped piece here. That's the maximum we can reasonably tolerate without you know, creating a roller coaster effect. Um, and, uh, but we have to maintain our, our ADA path. Um, and then we can also leave like an inch and a half lip on the edge of the concrete um, because it's drivable, it's not a wheelchair access. And you can, you, you sort of iterate those until you reach a happy medium where this is clearly a, a preference for the pedestrian while still uh, making it accessible for, for uh, both the vehicles and the pedestrians and the bikes and everything else that's that's working here. But there's a there's a lot of thought that goes into making this ultimate picture that's going to end up on the contract set. Great. All right. <clears throat> Do you guys have a cross section of what this um, connection to the bike path looks like? I'm really there's there's a there's a lot of grade there. So I understand you have like what is it a five or seven foot retaining wall right on the property line. Um, you say that the railing is right on the property line, but I think realistically it's going to have to be inbound of the retaining wall somewhat. Then you have a five story building on the other side. I just I don't really see how two bikes are going to be able to to cross each other's path along the the length of this building. Jeff, I think you do have a cross section, don't you? Like a typical cross section with the rail with the railing detail. Do you recall seeing that in your set? Or Chris, do you know where that is? Um, I know we've got at You're, least uh, the detail muted, wall. Jeff. Sorry. Um, yeah, the intent is that um, you know the wall would sit roughly on the property line or on the property line with a there it you know, is a, there you go right mounted just outboard you know that um, on the outside edge of that wall um, and yeah is 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 it tight for two bicycles you know two two bicycle people two bicycles riding past each other is is probably a little tight I my guess is that people will want to walk their bicycles you know along that section um yeah. cuz that's going to feel a lot safer. Yeah. But there's room for two people to pass each other with bikes. I think it's pretty similar to the kind of access you have at Jackson Street or or some of the other access to It's not what you want for the bike path itself, but as an access right. point I think it's reasonable. And and I, again I'll I'll throw out because I again I use this connection every day is even today it's easier to go through the church parking lot which has that connection there. Um, and I suspect that, uh, that that will continue to be the preferred route for people who do not want to walk their bikes. I, I agree with you that that's what it would be today. But what will it be in 20 years? It could be beaming in 20 years. What's that? We'll be just teleport? In years. Yeah. <laughs> I keep... I keep asking my eight-year-old daughter to invent that for me because someone needs underwater. We might be underwater. <laughs> uh, <Gosh>. So, uh, <laughs> unless unless uh, all of the electric shared cars, you know, catch on everywhere. Um, okay, so um, I am going to make a final call for oh George. No, go ahead and make your final call. For, for what public? <laughs> oh, for... I was going to say for for public comment. Uh, yep. And, go ahead. And so, is there anybody here from the public? Any last comments? Okay. Um, George, is your a comment for for board discussion, or do you have a question of the applicant? Uh, I have a question for the applicant. All right. Go ahead. So uh, let's go from the ground floor up to the roof again, if we could. Um, the amenities sound great for the residents. There's no doubt about it. I think um, there's a there's a lot that you're providing there. Um, I think perhaps we would want to make sure that it doesn't expand beyond just amenities, little social gatherings. I would assume that down the road, if the rooftop became popular and uh, the owners wanted to provide a, a larger function, 
um, or if, or if or if perhaps a restaurant wanted to become permanent up there, there would be a whole nother permitting process for that. Correct? I know in big cities, rooftop clubs are very popular. Um, so I guess I have a little nervousness about that becoming more than just a place where neighbors come to socialize. So that's just a comment, I guess. And Carolyn, I'm, I, I think you could help me by saying that there's some limit to, to the extent that they can provide uh, um, gatherings up there, you know, functions. But what if people want well, to go to that bar? <laughs> don't forget that this is central business. So um, mixed use um, clubs, resident re restaurants um, are all allowed. So I think that would be allowed, obviously, if they are creating a new um, physical space with, you know, vertical structural change that would trigger, um, who knows in the future if that will be a planning board review or just central business architecture, but it, it would, any kind of um, building material change would require an amendment, but the use, um, all of those uses are allowed um, in the CB. Uh, there may be, isn't this a good problem? I don't understand. I don't understand. Yeah, I, 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 I would, I would go to that. I would go to there if, if there were. Um, there may be other people on the board who could talk about what the over fifty-five crowd gets up to at night, but uh, I, I do think for uh, attracting people to have places where their whole family can come and gather is a very attractive thing for people who are transitioning to a really different type of housing situation. So I think you, ha I, I think you have to have it um, to 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 make this a. Uh, a good substitution for what someone was calling, you know, the suburban lifestyle. Great, I agree, I agree. But I lived in Boston for a number of years and I think these rooftop places too can stay open till two or three in the morning and create a whole nother uh, situation. But I'll move on from that. I just wanted to raise that. Could we see the photo, uh, the photo metric plan for a minute? And again, I, I'm mostly concerned about what's going on up on the roof in terms of the lighting. I, I, I totally understand that there aren't gonna be a lot of ground poles in the parking lot. There's not gonna be a lot of lighting down there, but I just wondered what the plans were for the rooftop. Yeah, I, I don't know. David, um, Kiva, can you speak to that or do you have any sense of what? Um... Um... To be honest, that has not all been fully designed. So if we go back to that sort of site plan, Jeff, that you have in your set, yep. I think that is probably the best drawing to give you a sense of flavor for what you know it could kind of feel like, but there's a lot of kind of engineering that has to be done in terms of understanding where mechanical equipment goes and things like that. I think the goal on the roof will remain the same that it does on the ground plane, which is you know, to keep low profile lights, no bare bulbs, no light pollution. I, I think that will always remain a goal, but I think this has to get more fully flushed out and designed, which just, um, you know, happens later on in the design process once we get all the engineers involved. Mm -hmm. So Carolyn, how do we handle that? Is that a staff review at your end? Um, because we want these, the final plans, right, to, to note their lighting outputs. Right. Well, so the zoning code would govern the, um, um, the amount of light. So just because they don't show, I mean, the lighting plan can change after the board approves a plan, so long as it meets the basic um, zoning requirements. I think you raise a really good point, particularly um, with respect to the bollard lighting that they're showing even on the ground, on the surface, on the site. Um, those LED bollard lights can really create glare offsite, far offsite, even though there's no technically no um, up lighting, but they're, they're really, those bulbs can really be glaring and visible from you know, across uh, the horizontal plane. I would be concerned about that on the roof, particularly because if, you know, if it's near the edge and 
people on the ground across the street, you know, might be looking across the skyline and then just be blinded by these, um, what seems on a spec to be a low profile light. So I think it's really important to make sure that those have full cutoffs um, or that, you know, if they're using, there is, a, the, and the applicant didn't mention in this meeting because it's not so important as it would be to the Central Business Architecture Committee, but I um, believe there's a parapet wall around at least the rear portion of the site, if Correct. not all the way around. So that's an opportunity to maybe hide some lighting so that there's maybe there's that same sort of step lighting or um, lighting that's maybe um, against that parapet wall so it doesn't rise up above the parapet um, that can provide enough lighting for folks who are, you know, being entertained um, with their martinis on the rooftop deck. Um, so, but I, but I think that's important to understand. And um, I think if the board is concerned about any changes to the lighting that might be on the t on the roof that you could set some parameters about the type of lighting that you know for example that no fixture can rise above the parapet or something like that um, if that you know, seems amenable to the applicant we would be certainly willing to do that and certainly willing to you know have that be a condition where we share the lighting plan for approval once it's developed um, all of that sounds completely reasonable to us and I think we share the same goal so if that's an appropriate way to handle it you know some kind of condition or something um, uh, I think that would be great from our point of view I think a condition I, is, asking, are, are uh, I think a condition asking um, for review of the lighting plan once it is uh, complete makes most sense as, as opposed to sort of like trying to divine in advance or constrain you from the outset. Um, I'd rather see you try to comply with what you say you want to do and right. um, and, and then approve or, or not or suggest changes from there. I, I would suggest that we just make them come back if they want to do something that's not already approved in the zoning. The zoning is pretty uh, extensive in what it defines. And I mean, are we afraid yeah, of waking okay up that. the cars at Ernie's garage across the street? I mean, what's the problem here? <laughs> I mean, well, this is a Dave, this is a this is a, a commercial district. I, I hardly see that this is a major issue, and and the zoning is very explicit in what kind of lighting is allowed. So if it's far different from what the zoning allows, we can look at it, I suppose. But it hardly seems like we should be micromanaging it at that point. I'm I'm sorry, David, but every major plan that we have, the developer, the applicant provides us with kind of the the lighting limits that go into the record as, as what they're going to provide now and five years from now. And then if the, he or she wants to come back for an amendment, they do that. We can't just um, go by the best faith thing and hope that the building inspector is going to come by and make changes once there's some complaints. It's much like a landscaping plan or the stormwater plan. Well, George, Please, even you, when they give us the, the foot candles, we're still relying on the building inspector to, to check the foot candles, right? Sure, sure. Yep, but at least we see them. We see the foot candles in all parts of the property. And they did a great, they, they showed us all the cutouts for the, the different kinds of fixtures they're using, which is great. Um, yeah, but my concern is that there's this huge hot spot in the center of town um, that does lots of things when we're really trying to limit our lighting, especially, you know, after 10 o'clock, think about how many permits we've done when we've asked people to turn off their lights at certain air, certain time of the night. Um, in commercial areas and in business areas. I just- My, my, my worry is that I, th there's there's some significant design time that takes to, to figure out where their condensers are gonna go or whatever and, uh, else happens on this roof. And it might be, I don't know what's going on with their financing or whatever, it might be a year. I don't know what the zoning board, the planning board's gonna look like at that point. I just, and then they're sucked in again to whatever, random things that people want to talk about at that point. I think this is a good project. We should be encouraging it to go forward. The zoning outlines what's legal and what's not legal. And if they say we're going to comply with zoning, I think we should say that's fine. I don't care that we've done it in the past. I mean, that's irrelevant. Maybe we shouldn't have done that in the past. I, I think it's, I think I completely agree. And I also think, I mean, the difference is, is that, I mean, the times where we talked about like shutting lights off at a, in, at a, in a, at around a school, you know, that was, 
in a residential area. This is a commercial area. And, um, you know, as long as everything meets, uh, meets the code, um, I, I think that we should, we should be encouraging these types of projects. I would also add, and, and then I want to get to Mr. Whalen, who's had his hand up. Um, I, um, I do agree with that. I mean, I definitely, you know, put, uh, you know, suggested the approve something after it's designed as, as opposed certainly to us now sort of arbitrarily coming up with things that we think would, would, um, you know, prevent a, a hypothetical issue down the road. I, one thing I really like about this project and the this, the design of it is the way that it extends, it truly extends downtown a little bit further down King Street in a, in a meaningful way. And that comes with it a different vibe, a different, um, you know, I, I mean, we joke, but if it ever did become a, a club or a restaurant or um, a bar up there, um, or if the use of it by the residents um, you know, meant that they, you know, hung uh, a hipster bar, you know, beer, beer garden lights, as are so popular these days. I, I don't know that I would, I, I would, I think that would be fine. I think that would be an extension of downtown and the vibe downtown and what we're trying to do to accommodate downtown um, and to develop and grow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I agree with that. And the, the main point is I don't want to constrain in advance of design um those kinds of things um and that would be my inclination so mr whalen well i i don't know what my rights are and i imagine they're extremely limited because zoning has been declared but uh just to let people know, there are second floor and uh third floor apartments uh in my building that would be dramatically impacted by any sort of nightlife um on the rooftop okay and no, that's good. And, and, i'm sorry and light and like, okay, um, that's that's helpful to know and understand. Um, anybody else have further comments about this? Or? Um, yes, I have some other comments, but unfortunately, I feel like I'm being painted into a uh, a, a non business supporter here. But I'll I'll keep going. Um, how are we handling refuse and uh, garbage collection here on the site? So, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, David, you may want to, you may have more details on it, but I know there's provisions for uh, a trash chute uh, central to the lobby area, and there will be a trash compactor and trash room on the lower level. Um, and the the plan is that we'll we'll contract with a, a private hauler to you know pick up um, you know pick up the refuse on a on a schedule that um, you know works works for the residents. Um, don't know exactly what that. You know, schedule that what that frequency is yet, but um, you know, all of that will be handled, you know, inside the building, so we don't need an exterior dumpster or, or trash receptacles. Okay. Good, thank you. I thought you said you had a couple of comments, George. Anything else? There's a large tree in the uh, the northwest corner of the current site. Um, was that that's coming down? I understand. Yeah. There's a on the street side. On the street side. In that. There's a. It's a large locust. So there's there's a clump of locusts right there. Yes. So those and those are those coming. Will, those are coming down, yes. And they were in the calculations for the other tree removals? Well, these, none of these, none of the trees in that clump were, were of a size that um, were subject to the. Ooh. Jeff, are you sure it was a clump? Are you sure it isn't one trunk that has many branches? Are you, I, I thought it was one large tree that maybe um, wasn't calculated, tree to be removed. Um, yeah, well, that's at least, I mean, according to our surveyors who were out there just last month, um, and I, you know, I could, we could confirm this <laughs> just looking out the office, um, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm pretty sure it's a, yeah, it's a clump of, a clump of, 
trees, not uh, just one large one. I can pull up the street view and then there can be no more mystery. There we are. Great. I had noted it just so everyone knows in um, a message to the applicant, I think also to the board that it appeared that it was a multi-stemmed or multi-trunk tree. So it would, you add if this, the um, portions of the trunks are additive um, for the total calculation. So um, that it would be included as um, a significant tree to be replaced. So I put that in as a recommended condition that the tally be recalculated, including that one. That's typically how the tree warden would um, calculate um, dimension. That makes sense. And it, it's not a DBH, Carolyn, just to clarify. It is, but you add the multiple trunks together to get to okay. the DBH. When it's, when it has, I mean, this, you know, you can't really zoom in too well on this. So I haven't been there to look at it myself, but it looks like it's stemming from the same root ball. Yep. If it's a black locust, it probably is. Yeah. So that's just, so we, you know, prior to- We can update that finals, in our calculations. Yeah, so prior to finishing plans, just, you know, flip that to the other side of the equation and um, that can be taken care of prior to your final sign off um, for certificate of occupancy. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Um, so, it, so before I recap um, what, what I think I've heard of the uh, potential conditions, does anybody have any further questions, remarks? I had, I had one more question. Okay. Um, just in the DP or sorry, the DPW comments, um, they were talking about the electrical service. It looks like from Street View, that's coming from the rear. Is that is that true? Is that I can clarify? Happening? It actually it comes from both the front and the rear. Um, Where would you be tying in? So the um, obviously the. The electrical engineering for this project has not been completed or, or really uh, developed very much. Um, but so there's an existing electrical manhole um, and duct bank that runs along this sidewalk, which comes across King Street, uh, runs underground to this point, and then from there connects via overhead to the bike path. Um, so in a preliminary layout, um, similar to projects we've had uh, on sites kind of like this in Holyoke, um, we took the electrical manhole as, as a likely connection point, but DPW has pointed out that especially with some recent issues that they've had with unmarked private utility service in the street, that, um, that they essentially would oppose that connection. So instead the connection would happen through the rear off of one of these poles, um, to be determined the, ex you know, the exact location of that connection by the utility. Um, but there's three phase power that comes all the way through the site uh, from underground on King Street to overhead uh, along the bike path. So you'll have to coordinate with the utility to, to reroute that? Like I, it's going underneath your, your, your building, right? Um, your, your so, yeah, let me, let me bring, the, bring a better plan. Path. Yeah, so, so we would likely connect somewhere in the back and route it around the building to the mechanical space up here. Okay. Right. No, I, think, I think Chris is asking about the existing underground line, if that's gonna right. be in place. Oh, right? yeah, so, so the, there's an existing underground line that is actually um, uh, along the curb of this driveway. Uh, that's where the dig safe mark placed it. Um, so it is not under the building. Okay. Maybe I'm looking at an old plan or something. It just seemed like there was, from your survey, there's the overhead wire. What, it was hitting a pole that's basically under your retaining wall now. 
Uh, the poles are all actually on the Wayland side of this property line. Um, and I think this plan will show it more clearly. Um, right. This is one pole here. Mm -hmm. This is the yeah, first the one. one. Yeah. I don't so think it'd be I'm, difficult, but is this how is this discussion furthering something that we have per, per, purview over in, in a condition? I, I, I if there's it's, if it's getting to something that we need to set as a condition, great. If not, can okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering stop. where this is going. Right. <laughs> I withdraw all comment. It's all right. I I don't mean to shut it down. I'm just us non contractor engineering type people. Uh, I I want to know what condition it's going toward. Um, is there, okay. Um, I, uh, do, so if there's no other further questions for the, um, for the applicant, um, do I hear a motion to close public comment? I just have a couple, I just, I don't know if you want to close public comment. I have a couple of issues about that you all didn't talk about related to conditions and some of them incorporate DPW comments. You all can certainly discuss those outside of public hearing uh, or after the hearing is closed, but I just want to make sure that you are aware of those. Uh, yeah, no, please go ahead. I was going to recap what was on the um, the notes and my notes of what I think has come up in discussion. Okay. okay. So please go ahead. Sure. So um, just to um, uh, bring in the DPW comments that um, the state started sort of um, discussing, there were some other comments from DPW about the um, depth of um, pavement for the bike path, wanting sort of updated plans that um, have that reinforced from a, a one and a quarter inch depth to one and a half inches. Um, and um, that should be shown in revised plans in addition to the other issues you all have been discussing. Um, and um, that uh, operation and maintenance plan for the stormwater system should be um, provided to um, staff uh, before the applicant records that, and that should be done before the start of construction. So that's all in place. That's a typical requirement when there's a um, you know new stormwater infrastructure on a project of the scale. And um, there were some minor issues related to the tree planting, other plan details that should be um, updated. There was a tree planting detail that um, um, should require that if wire baskets are on the new trees, they need to be removed entirely, um, as opposed to just being pulled back partially. Um, and tree protection should be installed prior to construction um, and the applicant should uh, submit a statement from a certified arborist stating that that tree protection has been installed in accordance with um, the appropriate protection measures for those trees. Um, and I think we talked about the ramp sidewalk ramping up already and that seemed to be clarified in the plan. So I'm not sure the original statement that I given to you all about that would necessarily need to be included as a condition. Um, and then we also talked about the tree replacement um, um, calculation to be retabulated. So that's actually those are the comments that I had that incorporate some of DPW's concerns as well. Okay. Um, any further questions or comments about any of what Caroline just uh, talked about? Okay. Um, so with yeah, I have a quick question. So. Within our conditions, how are we going to handle the lighting on the premises? There's one condition that talks about shielding the bollards. Does that satisfy the board in terms of lighting requirements? Well, I was going to suggest I was going to save it for uh, the board discussion, but my my thinking on that is that uh, that when is that I'd like them to bring back a lighting plan when when they have it for for approval. Um, I mean, that would be my suggestion for a condition um, rather than kind of 
pinging separate issues that have, have been identified and hypothesizing about future ones that could come up. And so that we can look at comprehensively at what they do and take into consideration the neighbors that we now understand. So know, Marissa, are you saying you don't want to approve this until they bring a lighting plan? No, I can we can we approve it with with the condition that they bring back the lighting plan, Carolyn? Yeah, so you can approve the whole project and, and say that prior to construction, they have to come back to the board with a lighting plan, um, the final lighting plan um, that will be for um, final sign off by the board um, or they can, you know, start construction so that you see what the final plan is for lighting. And that doesn't, that can be sort of segmented and separated out from the overall permitting. Right. And well, because it, it seems like rather than this, or if there is a, I guess that's my question is there, is there a better place to bring back that plan a little earlier in the process than sort of like final approval? Or I mean, I just don't know at what interim point um, we should say we want to see your plan and needs to be in place before you start at, you know, getting. Well, I mean, far. it's really, it's up to them. You know, they they have some work to do before they break ground. So in the interim, they can, uh, you know, they could bring it back any time, but the final opportunity would be before they break ground. Essentially, they have to have the final okay. plans approved, but that gives mm -hmm. them flexibility that they can decide when they're ready to come back. Okay. I actually think it's a great idea, Marissa. Okay. Well, and I credit George as well for, for I, bringing I, it I think it's, it's George's idea. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm being very chick about that, aren't I? Deflecting the, um, but I, I want, I'm cognizant of George's uh, concerns as well. And I'm concerned about the neighbors that we heard about from Mr. Whalen. So I want to make sure we address that um, when we have a plan. Um, so, um, okay, so I'm a little bit, uh, Carolyn, you, you said a lot of things. Um, and as I'm a little bit at a loss as to what of those things um, ought to be articulated as conditions. Um, uh, so, well, actually, let's come back to that. I would like to close public comment now um, and, and get to board. Carolyn, can you participate if we close public comment? Yeah, okay. I'm not public. <laughs> You're not public, okay. Um, okay, so with that said, let's, let's get that business taken care of. Do I hear a motion to close public comment? I make a motion to pu close public comment. Thank you. Do I have a second? Sam's big thumb. It's only big because it's right in front of the camera. Um, okay, so um, uh, David, how do you vote? Wait, yeah. wait. I'm sorry. That was a big sigh, George. Are you do do you have any further comment, or do you want? Well, yeah, my only comment is, as was noted early in, as we opened up the meeting, that this is the biggest project Northampton has seen in who knows how long. And it, we seem to be, uh, board members seem to be, just want to approve this and move it along. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think we're doing our due diligence. Um, so that was my big sigh, that I think there's other things that we could um, talk about, we could ask the developer to come back with us one more time because um, they are certainly, they did not expect, I would think, to have this approved in one night considering all the details that are still not on the plans. Um, so that's my comment. So um, so I, I wouldn't be in favor of closing the public comment right now, but of course I could be outvoted. Very easily, George. George, you're you're free to ask them any of those questions and to come back with more information. I mean, you're free to ask them that if you want. I mean, but if you don't have I, questions, we don't want to keep them coming back just because it's a big project. They have to come back. There's no, that's not a rule. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I brought up the one about the um, the, the lighting plan not having uh, enough specificity there. There was another comment about the, uh, the electrical drawing, the drawings for the utilities that they haven't been worked out yet. Um, so, and I think there were some other ones that I, I can't put my thumb on right now um, that uh, they were certainly, they themselves realized that they hadn't done their own um, preparedness for this meeting. 
Um, so we're all very trusting at this point that everything's going to work out fine. I don't. Well, uh, George, I don't know that I'm I'm trusting that that on their good faith. I I have I'm, I have I understand the 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 zoning and the building code regulations that they're that are going to govern them in addition to us i mean like our discretion is is uh is pretty i i guess i it's not it's not a matter for me of of that i i don't think it's the purview of this board to have them nail down every last uh detail before we approve it i think we have oversight as the project goes on um with the other parameters that are provided by the zoning, but, but I mean, you have a different view of it, but I, I just don't feel like I have much to contribute to a in-depth detailed discussion about where the electric lines are coming in. I, I, I mean, only, and I don't begrudge I'm Chris for having that discussion. That. I just don't know what, what I, why that, how that's in the purview of the, the planning board at that granular level. My, my worry about that one detail is um, that's kind of setting the placement of the building uh, and I, I don't understand if that's a Eversource easement or, or what's going on with that underground electrical and those overhead lines. So um, if, if part of their project rests on relocating utility poles on another person's property, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't sound like it, it works the way it's drawn right now. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I just, I don't, I mean, but that is their issue to resolve if it costs them more money or they have to negotiate with a, 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 a neighbor and a butter or, or something like that. Um, I, I, for the purposes of us, we have to look at whether or not it complies with, complies with the zoning laws and whether or not, you know, we, we, we have limited discretion to, to turn it down and delaying doesn't seem to be, I mean, oversight, yes, continue, continuing oversight of this big project is going to come, but I don't know why we would delay it. Um, I see this kind of like, a, you know, if, if, if there's some CONSCOM issue, we can't give them zoning approval because CONSCOM hasn't approved. It's, those are two separate oversights, you know, we, the zoning itself. I, I would just say that if there was something about the utility location that required an adjustment in the site plan that was big enough to then were it might warrant them having to come back for an amendment. So um, if something dramatically changes, then you would have to see it again. And so that's the risk the applicant is taking by not actually fine tuning everything and maybe not being able to get what they want, but that just means they would come back for an amendment. I think one of the bigger issues that, about the electric utility, which would be a planning board site plan review issue, as well as a central business architecture committee review issue is if there's a utility box that has to be um, located on site, that it not be front and center between the sidewalk and the building. Um, you know, we've had project, new projects that have been approved and that, part of it, the connection wasn't part of the um, review. And for instance, fly by night, there's a big ugly box right in the pedestrian view and access to that building. And so I think that's probably an issue that makes sense to e either the planning board or central business um, identify as a site plan issue that it has to be set back, you know, behind the front facade of the building that it can't be between the building and the street if there is such a box. Um, but then you could allow the rest of the details to be worked out by the applicant. Um, and to the extent that it doesn't affect the site plan that you've approved, then you won't ever see it again. But you won't have a need to see it again. And just to chime in on that, I think Jeff or Chris, you were mentioning that in all likelihood, we're going to be servicing the building from the rear of the property, which could be a happy coincidence to avoid all of those undesirable outcomes. Right. Yeah, all the indications are now that the DPW would like us to serve it from the back of the property, from those from that service back there. And it, it, if that's a condition that would require us to, you know, if we do anything different from that, that it requires us to submit an amendment, um, I think that makes perfect sense. I also feel like the 
the fact that they're going through the CBEC or the central business architecture process is far more uh, arbitrary and, and uh, arduous than any zoning issues that, I mean, I, I don't think anything that they're asking for is, is, is all that far past, you know, what, what a sort of by right reading of the, of the zoning is. So uh, I think a lot of those issues are being dealt with at the central business architecture committee and it does not help the city at all to have that happen on a dual track process. I mean, just if any, if you want to have no housing ever in Northampton, let's have two committees looking at the same issues without communicating with each other. I mean, <laughs> um, okay. Um, so reminding people that if they don't with, if they, I don't know, wish to hold this open for further public, uh, comments or public discussion, I guess, at some later point or meeting. Uh, I just they think can that, vote no. <laughs> I guess I, I, I would move to close public comment and I, and I guess I would say that, um, that I think that, um, you know, we can put the caveats in there that will for, force their hand to come back uh, to, uh, to us if there's, if there's any changes and otherwise um, we should just trust the process. Okay. Well, listen, I have a motion on the table. Um, I was, I was simply stating that uh, you can vote no. If you don't wish to pu close public comment, we will, you don't have to vote yes. Um, I think once again, we're in the middle of voting here. So. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, and I opened it because I, I, I uh, responded to, uh, to, to what I heard. So, um, David. I still vote yes. Chris. Yes. Sam. Yes. Corinne. Yes. Krista. Yes. George. And I'll still vote no. And I vote yes. Um, I, um, so with public comment uh, closed, um, I, I guess I would just like to clarify that if we were to approve uh, something tonight, uh, what it would be and what the conditions would be. Um, and that sort of gets back to what I said to Carolyn earlier, there was a long, uh, kind of a long laundry list. I'm not sure how it boiled down to a specific list of conditions. Um, and so I wonder Gerard if, if you could say that again, but in the format of conditions that could be proposed. Sure. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm just writing in the last note about the electric utilities from the rear. Okay, let's see. So, um, conditions related to sort of pre-construction prior to um, the start of construction um, and issuance of building permit. Um, the applicant shall submit final lighting plans to be approved by the planning board that comply with the zoning uh, prior to issuance of a building permit and start of construction. The applicant shall submit to um, planning staff a draft uh, recordable operations and maintenance plans for the stormwater system and shall record such plan prior to issuance of a building permit. Um, the maintenance schedule shall include structures on the plan, um, including catch basins, area drains, treatment chambers, the green roof, trench trains, etc. cetera. Um, plans shall be amended to um, include tree protection details, um, tree planting details in compliance with the city's tree planting guidelines. Prior to construction, tree ins um, installation of tree protection as shown on the plan shall be performed and written certification of such tree protection shall be submitted 
to the Office of Planning and Sustainability by a certified arborist. Um, the building shall be served by electrical utilities coming from the rear of the property. And final tree replacement shall be planted on site or payment in uh, lieu of tree replacement in accordance with section 12.3 shall be made. Um, and that's prior to certificate of occupancy. Um, I do have that uh, reminding me of one <coughs> other issue that um, the board uh, <coughs> um, didn't discuss. Um, I think it came um, up in the DPW comments. It did come up in DPW comments about um, tree planting. Um, if there was room for tree planting between the building and the, and the street because of the setback. Typically in Central <laughs> Business District, um, um, with a zero setback, trees along the frontage are not required, but the zoning would otherwise require tree planting. Um, so I don't know how the board feels about, um, since they are going to have to do tree replacement as part of their um, mitigation, um, potentially one tree could be located in that in between the building and the street as part of their replacement in a, in a you know, structural soil or some other um, tree filter box that's appropriate for a street tree planting location. So um, that could be part of the tree replacement um, um, criteria if the board felt that was appropriate. And that's all I have. That, that's all. <laughs> um, it's a big project. Um, I, uh, I think that covers all the things that we would want to hear back about and see about and oversee throughout the, throughout the process. I like the idea of the, um, of asking that they do a tree in front um, to continue again the continuity with downtown and what they're doing there and maybe reimagining downtown what it'll look like and see how that comes together um, so I'd be in favor of that um, so um, any discussion further from the board about those conditions or about that as a package for the moment um, Uh, just to clarify, uh, I guess a question for Carolyn. I mean, the current plans do show a tree sort of next to the uh, driveway on the north. Uh, I think those do you mean in ones. addition to that? Um, I uh, let me just pull up the plans. Um, There's updated I don't... plans, right? Yeah, Jeff or Chris, you may recall this better than I do. There's an ornamental tree on that northern it's edge. Like a kind ginkgo. Of... There, there is a tree right at that, right before that crossing. Yeah, that driveway on the north side. Yeah. It, um, so I didn't see the. Yes, I did mean in addition to that. Um, um, it, you know, to the extent it's possible. I mean, they have a 10 foot, um, in addition to the five foot sidewalk, there's still, you know, um, the setback to the building. Um, so there may be an opportunity to do another tree in addition to that one. That's what I, um, that seemed to be more of a, a smaller ornamental tree. And it's not as though, I, I don't think, you know, it would necessarily be appropriate for a large tree, but we obviously, there are lots of trees to that uh, from the tree planting um, guidelines that can that would be appropriate for a site of that sort with that you know that those constraints what's the um, overall width of the site sorry i don't have it here um, the, the frontage is how long 
You mean from the depth from the back of the street no. to the back of the curb? To no, the just building? the frontage, the length of frontages. Uh, here we go, uh, 130. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have a driveway and then a street, then something like a street tree, and then we have another 80 feet or something. Yeah. Yeah, that seems, I like that. Let's make them with 20 trees. <laughs> no, I mean, you could fit a couple of trees in there. It seems like seems like a reasonable uh, ask. All right. And it's pretty pretty stark there on King Street. It is. Um, okay. Um, anybody else? Any last thoughts? Okay, um, so it seems like uh, we have a, a lot for the applicants to go back and work on and uh, for us to check back in on them when they, they come back um, with some other things to review when they become final. Um, do I hear a motion to uh, approve the site plan with these conditions um, as laid out by Carolyn, including the tree in front? And not scare off any new people. You don't have to recite all the conditions. I think we do need to be clear if we're going to ask them to add another tree to be a little bit clearer about what we're asking them. Uh, is that, are we asking them for one more tree in, fr in the front of the building? Is that? I don't know. I think Carolyn suggested one. You were the one who tossed out 20. So Yeah. Somewhere between one and 20 trees should be added to the front of the... Uh, uh. With 80 feet, that's not enough room for 20 trees. Not 20. But no, but you could do two. I mean, you could do them every 30 feet. The standard is one per, yeah, yeah, 30 feet. So they could do two additional. All right. Two trees would be better than one tree. Let, let's say, uh, just 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 for uh, technical reasons, let's, I mean, say at least one. I think it, 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 I would, that's what I would do. OK. Do I do I hear a motion? I think David should do the motion. I'll do the motion. Okay, so uh, well, the first one that we added was Carolyn. I'm looking at the list of, uh, of of conditions, but there was one that you added before the first one. Say it again. Um, yes. So prior to, right prior to const, um, construction, that the um, applicant um, has to submit a final lighting plan. Oh, right, lighting plan. Okay. Planning board approval. All right, so I, I, I move we uh, approve this application uh, with a final lighting plan being submitted before building permit application, I guess, is that how it works? Uh, and that they record the storm warning permit, stormwater permit, that revised plans we submitted, um, including the tree protection details and uh, uh, written certification from the licensed arborist, uh, that tree protection is installed and uh, driveway uh, entrance uh, shall ramp up to the sidewalk, sidewalk remaining consistent at six feet, six feet width across the driveway. Um, the bollard light should have recessed lamps or shields attached to the fissure final tree replacement shall be planted on site or payment into the tree replacement fund can be made for 40 inches now still of uh, replacement required. No, now it's 50. Six, six. Yeah. I thought 40 was the final number, but maybe I was confused. What is it? It's 40 or 56? Um, I think well that can be determined prior okay. to CO, but it's based on the calculation of that, those two trees as opposed to just the one in the back. I believe it's going to be um, 56 and not. And that one additional tree be uh, shown in the uh, plaza area between in the setback and the front setback between uh, the building and King Street. At least one tree. The end. All right. All that motion and uh, second. second. And Sam seconds. Uh, okay, um, so with that said, uh, David, how do you vote? Hmm. I see this. 
Chris. Yes. Corinne. Yes. Krista. Yes. Sam. Yes. George. Oh, leave me for almost last, Marissa. I'll say no to this one. I, not okay. that I'm not in favor of the project. I just don't think we've uh, done enough due process for it. Uh, I vote yes. All righty. It's a great project. I look forward to seeing it develop. Um, and I look forward to the lighting plan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. And, and yes, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so, all of my devices are powering down. <laughs> uh oh. That uh, means it's, you need to power down soon. <laughs> I, might, I might have to. Well, no, I have to go. I have to go plug in my computer here in just a second. Uh, and 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 go sans ear pods, but I think it'll be okay. It's just funny how it's all happening at one time. Um, I'm looking for the agenda. That's what I was looking for. All right. Um, so a couple last things. Um, I, let me do that. Let me get. Let me plug in my computer one second, and then we'll mm -hmm. resume. Okay. Karin, you're still with us. Hanging that on. You're hanging on, huh? I'm up Good. past my bedtime already, though. <laughs> this would, this has so far been an easy night. By the end of it, we'll all be old enough to move into this new development. <laughs> Ooh, some of us are already, David. Well, you got another 15 or 20 years, George, I think, before you get 55, right? <laughs> it's the biking is a good is a good choice if you too young. Are we doing minutes? Is that what we're doing? Yes. Well, we have A and R's and minutes. All right. So, so we just have the uh, one set of minutes to review. Yeah. Okay. I I go to two the minutes. I have a second. Can we go back to gallery view? Now, do I have a second? Second. Second. Sure. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so, um, on the motion to approve the minutes from the previous meeting, um, David. So, just I wasn't at this meeting, but for Corinne's education, I'm still going to vote to approve these minutes to show that it, it does not matter if I was at the meeting or not. <laughs> It's it's true. I didn't. I failed to ask if anybody had any uh, omissions or uh, amendments. I wonder if I should go back. Um, actually, I'm going to table the motion for just a minute because I didn't ask. Does anybody? Did anybody see any? Have any corrections or additions or uh, to the minutes? Okay. No. Nope. I I shall resume the vote then. Um, so David already voted yes. Do you res re Persist with that vote? Okay. Um, Sam? Uh, yes. Chris? Yes. Corinne? Yes. George? Yes. Krista? Yes. And I vote yes as well. All right. So Corinne, now we're going to do A and R's. And here's where we listen to Carolyn. And she tells us some things. And then we say we vote on it. But you can't vote no. <laughs> Okay, so the first, the, an ANR is an approval not required, which means subdivision approval is not required by the planning board. And a subdivision is the creation of a street. So what I'm showing you on this screen is a swap of land from one parcel to another. Um, so it's just this rectangular piece here, this 15 feet wide going, um, it's labeled as parcel A would go from um, this um, property owner to 129A property owner. So from 
117 to 129 um, to add to 129A's lot. So there's no new parcel being created. It's just a transfer of land. So I just need a, um, a vote to endorse this plan that it's um, not a subdivision plan. I move to endorse the plan. Second. All right, is that Sam? Yeah. Hearing, uh, having a motion to approve uh, and seconded. Um, Corinne, how do you vote? Yes. Sam. Yes. Oh, yeah. Chris. Yes. David. Yes. Krista. Yes. George. Yes. And I also vote yes. Okay, so we have another one um, that is the creation. And in this case, it is a creation of a lot, but it's on an existing street um, on Sherman Avenue. Um, so there's this one large parcel. There's an old garage set at the rear. The property owner wants to divide it into two 50 foot wide frontage lots, which are the minimum is the minimum lot width um, and frontage uh, required for single family house or two family house lot in the urban residential B district. So they're showing adequate frontage on an existing street. So it's not, it does not require a new subdivision road to be constructed. Okay, do I hear a motion to approve the ANR? <laughs> Chris, nope. I can't approve this ANR. <laughs> so moves. So moves. Uh, uh, no, but seriously, can we, I have a motion? No, no, so move to the approval, not to Chris, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what Chris is talking about. <laughs> well, approval is not required. We can endorse oh, it. Oh, right. We can okay, endorse. Sorry. That's right. Okay, that's right. We'd like to endorse an A and R. You're right. Thank you for the, the more precise language. Uh, so, a motion to endorse the A and R. Yes, a moved. And a second. Second. Okay. Uh, Corinne. Yes. Sam. Yeah. Chris. Yes. David. Yes. Krista. Yes. George. Yes. I also endorse. Uh, and therefore it is now endorsed. Um, the third one you can't do yet because that was the one you continued to September. Um, so you have to do it on the heels of the, if the board approves that permit, then you can approve the ANR. So that's all I have for tonight. Okay. Um, I actually have a question. Um, are we given this sort of Delta virus thing, are we going, coming back in September to get? I thought they had, weren't they changing, or weren't we meeting, like expanding Zoom in September? The, yes. The, um, the plan was to come back to in-person hearings in September. Um, I, um, nothing's changed so far. Um, and, you know, that's several weeks away anyway. <laughs> and who knows what the status will be at that point. So um, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But there's, I mean, we're, the public's still allowed in the building. So, you know, there may be other rules about how, you know, of course we have to be masked inside. So, um, you know, I, we're just gonna have to wait and see what's going on in September. I like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I do miss the in-person discussions. I think it's harder to uh, talk through bigger projects um, in this format um, and a lot is lost, but I also worry, worry about um, the current moment. So um, 
I, I do think actually just in terms of public comments, I think it lowers the barriers to comment um, to sort of everybody um, in a way, which is interesting. Is there any hybrid thing being discussed or it's all or nothing or how's that work? Oh no, I mean, we actually had a, we had an in-person hearing with Central Business Architecture um, last week. Um, and uh, we structured it with in-person and Zoom, but the people who wanted to um, uh, view through Zoom, it was just viewing. So we didn't take public comment from Zoom participants unless they wanted to submit something in writing ahead of time, which is always available. Um, so that was made clear on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So if you want to speak during the hearing, you have to be present. And if you want to just follow along um, in Zoom land, um, that was also made available. And we actually, I mean, we had quite a few, quite a few participants on Zoom, um, you know, over 20 people um were on zoom and then we had people in person as well so there's still some technical glitches we're trying to work through but it went it went off pretty well so just out of your, i don't know how this works are you do we have to go and watch that on on youtube or something or are you allowed to talk about what happened in the CBAC meeting with this project or how, um oh sure with this project the um they actually continued the hearing, I right. thought I'd put that in the staff. Yeah, room, that was there, but just, can, was yeah, there a lot of can, comments on it? Um, yeah, the Central Business Architecture Committee really liked the project, but they just needed more details, um, you know, about dimensions and cross sections about, and, and they had, uh, um, they asked for some revisions to some materials and some, they asked about stepping back, um, the driveway, the garage entrance, so it didn't feel so, um, I guess, imposing on the street. Um, and so the applicant's gonna come back in October with those changes, but they were all, um, you know, it was a good dialogue between the applicant and the committee. Uh, the committee was very supportive of the project, but just it got down to the, the real details of materials, um, the, the um, just indication of the um, size and, and, and um, dimensions of those materials just weren't spelled out clearly enough on the plans. Um, and then some requests for speeches. So if they're moving the building back, I mean, what does that have to do with what we just approved? Well, I don't know that they are. They're gonna look at just shifting a component of the structure back, not the whole building, just sort of the garage pillar, they were talking about pushing that back. So I don't think it really changes the overall site um, um, site plan, but we'll, we'll see what the what the, that results in. Okay. Great, thanks. Yep. Uh, okay, do I hear a motion to close the meeting? So moved. That was David. Second. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Can't you. see Sam's thumb. Yeah, that's right. Um, all right, Corinne. We have to vote. We still have to vote to adjourn. Oh, okay. Uh, is that a yes? I think. Yes. Um, Sorry. Uh, Sam. Yeah. Chris. Yes. David. Yes. Krista. Okay, George. Yes. I also vote to adjourn. So, all right, y'all. Thanks. Thanks for.